I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then, I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12-gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything, but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic, and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open, and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. 
I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour. It was now 5.30 in the morning, and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved, for a second, until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact, and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore but it does show up. Sometimes, when I'm in the living room watching a movie or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night, and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident, and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days, actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. I am a 27-year-old female, and my sister is 26, with a husband who is also 26, and a 9-month-old baby girl. They got married coming up on two years ago this summer. Just before they got married, they started to build a new house on a plot of land that's essentially in the woods, on a dead-end road with most of the 16 acres going uphill. The road itself is pretty quiet, with maybe 10 houses total, pretty spaced out new houses. They only have one next door neighbor. This is important. So, as I said, they just built this house not even three years ago. The thing with the property, though, is that they found at least one, and maybe another, partial house or building stone foundation. Now, our dad, being the history detective that he is, had found an old property map that basically said that there used to be a farmhouse right where their now backyard is, hence the stone foundation. My dad has gone there to do metal detecting quite a few times, and he's found some neat stuff. Some was just the typical metal containers, cans, trash, and junk that he found at the foundation, tossed in by who knows, but a few neat things were a belt buckle, what appears to be, according to his treasure hunting online forum, either a woman's or a child's sword or knife guard, and that dates to when the farmhouse was there, in the mid to late 1700s. Now for the spooky stuff. So, I've stayed overnight there a few times, in the guest bedroom, over a year ago at least. My sister and I went out drinking, and I just ended up staying overnight. I was alone in the guest room, snuggled in bed, when I felt like something, or someone, was watching me. So much so, that I pulled my blankets over my head, and tried to sleep. Then I had the urge to close the closet door randomly. I eventually fell asleep and thought nothing of it after the fact. I never mentioned it to her or her husband, since they're both highly Catholic and participate in church and stuff, so I didn't think they would get me. That's the only experience I've had, if that counts. Fast forward to now, she sent me a photo on Sunday which sparked our conversation. The picture was of her side entrance door that goes into the mudroom. In the top corner window, there is what appears to be, I haven't seen it in person, a smudged handprint. At first my thought was, okay, maybe the builders did it, or maybe it was something there when the door was being made or put on. So I told her that, and then she texts back, 
that it's not on the inside or the outside of the window. It's between the panes. Weird, right? My sister said that it was definitely not there before, since she's basically a neat freak and has washed the door windows before, many times. My second thought was we've had some rain and humidity recently, being almost summer and all, so maybe it was some moisture of fog and stuff like that that was between the glass panes that just looked like a handprint. It literally does look like a handprint, though, after looking at the picture for a while. I'm studying the picture, and I start to get this weird thought of maybe it's somebody scoping the house, but it's on the top window, facing downward, and it's as if they, or it, had their left hand pointed down, pressed from the outside. I tried to recreate how it would look or feel if I did it myself. It's an extremely awkward position, especially if you're peeking into a door or window from the top pane, like six feet off the ground. She was thoroughly freaked out, I think. I usually try to eliminate all of the obviously logical reasons of what it could have been. A raccoon? A person? Moisture? I ask her if she's had anything weird happen, out of curiosity. This was her actual text message back to me. Quote, I was running on the treadmill a couple of months ago at night. My husband was gone, and I got a very forceful tap on my left shoulder like someone wanted my attention." End quote. Obviously, I've redacted her husband's name. I think it was probably a muscle twitch or something, but she was freaked out after that. Then she goes on to say, quote, and I hear voices sometimes. My husband thinks I hear the neighbors, but when I'm inside, it literally sounds like a man and a woman on our porch. End quote. It was a super quiet area. Like I said, they only had one neighbor. It could have possibly been her neighbors with sound traveling or something, but still. I asked about the baby, and she said that she does look off into random corners like she's watching something, but that doesn't seem that odd to me for a nine-month-old. Nothing really with the monitors either. I'm going over today after work to see my niece. I meant to mention to her to maybe check on her carbon monoxide detectors, just to be safe. So, I'll tell her tonight. It's one of those situations where some of the stuff is pretty weird, and other stuff could possibly be explained. I was hesitant to even tell the story, since nothing super or overtly paranormal has happened yet. Just feelings and weird things. But I wanted your thoughts. What are your suggestions? What do you think is going on, if anything? My husband wrote his perspective about me shifting realities after some grocery store incident with my daughter I wanted to share the story from my point of view. I was in the grocery store with my daughter doing some shopping. We were down the canned chili aisle. While walking by the chili to the left, I mentioned to my daughter that it was too bad that no one in the house liked chili dogs. She replied with, yuck, mom, hot dogs are gross. I said, okay, well, we do need some canned corn. So I looked above the aisle to read the signs above all the aisles that I could see and I noticed the canned vegetables were on the next aisle, to the right. So we walked, got to the end of the aisle, and turned right. Before we turned the corner to the aisle on the right, I looked down it and saw the chili to the left. I stopped and said to my daughter, Hey, weren't we just down the chili aisle? My daughter said, Whoa, Mom, we were. But now we're standing outside the two aisles looking back and forth between both of them. I looked to the one on the right, the one that we had just been down, and I saw baking goods like flour and stuff like that. We both kind of tripped out a little and laughed about it, chalking it up to just being confused. I'm open-minded, but this definitely couldn't be possible. We wrapped up our shopping and came home. Fast forward to dinner time, minus a few details. 
The long story short is that I noticed my son's features looking slightly different to me. I kept saying how he just looked slightly older. Kind of like when you send your kid to camp for a week and when you see them, you notice how they aged just a wee bit from the last time you saw them. I asked my husband if he thought it was possible for a person to notice the moment of the slightest change of aging in a child. We're pretty open-minded in our house and we like to entertain conversations that don't always fall in line with society's standards. It's fun and we like to think for ourselves. At some point, a while later, my daughter said, Hey, mom, tell them about what happened at the store. I told the story and my husband, being his lovable weird self, said, I think you experienced a glitch in the matrix. Maybe my old wife is gone and that's why our son looks different. I laughed it off because I always like to see the rational side of things and also thought he was mostly joking. So he posted about it. I have no idea what really happened at that store. Had my daughter not been there to experience it with me, I might actually believe that I in fact do have some kind of mental illness, like so many of the commenters seem to think. I'm also a firm believer that that's how most of society is brainwashed to think. Oh, this is weird, someone's losing their mind, give them meds. Over the past five years, I've been on a journey of loosening the grip that society's conditioning has had on me and trying to unlearn most of the things from my upbringings. I'm trying to learn to think for myself and also to realize that my life may not be what it seems to the next person. Perception is everything and experiences are different depending on who's experiencing them and how they vary. I'm not saying that I shifted realities. I'm also not saying that I'm insane. There is no black and white. There's only what I experienced and nobody will see things the way I do. Maybe I will never truly know what happened and that's part of life. Nothing has to have an answer. Not every situation out of the cookie cutter life experience has to be labeled as crazy. My challenge to all the skeptics ready to deem me insane is that nothing is what it seems. Have an open mind. The next time you judge a person based on a story, try to think of all the times someone was trying to judge you based on a situation that you saw completely differently. Does that make you insane? Like I said, I would definitely have seen a doctor had it not been for the fact that my daughter and I experienced the exact same thing. Anyway, that's my perspective of what happened that day. I may never be able to explain it, and that's okay. About six months ago or so in South Texas, I was visiting my family in a decently sized RV park in a run down side of town. It was maybe 10 p.m. or so at the time and the dog had to go out. My dog only does his business at the end of the street in a buddy of mine's lawn and has issues passing due to a tumor in his back. So I always stop at the end of the street and kind of watch the stars and stuff and wait for him. Well, I looked down the street near the entrance to the park, and under this lonesome streetlight, I saw a silhouette of a child, maybe 9 to 12 years old, just standing there, almost in a T pose, but not quite. The odd thing I noticed was the hands, which were open enough where it was almost like a crab, like in the sense that you could see the thumb, etc., and the fingers had zero movement. I was puzzled trying to figure out how this figure was so dark under the streetlight, even though it was literally like seeing someone just enough to make out the outline in the darkness. I mean, zero light was reflected on this kid. Just utter darkness, like a void. The only thing I could think was that somebody was pulling a random prank and actually put a cutout or a mannequin even in the middle of the road. But again, I was still confused how it remained so pitch black directly under a light source that bright. I didn't walk up to it because of two reasons. One, being my dog, who was still trying to do his business. And second, I have a keen sense of picking up on negative energy. And it was the same vibe I felt in the haunted house I grew up in, where I also had several spiritual encounters. I sat there staring for more than a few minutes just focusing on fine points of this silhouette, looking for the slightest flinch of movement, but I never saw it. 
It was at this time I figured I would pull out my phone and try to zoom up on this figure. But oddly, the screen in my camera mode was pitch black, so I couldn't make anything out. And when I did zoom up to where I surely thought the figure should be, I saw nothing but the street light through the lens. A couple actually began to walk behind this kid around this time, and I noticed that they didn't even glance at or acknowledge this kid standing maybe six feet or less from them as they walked by. What was super weird was as they passed under the same street light, you could make out everything, from facial expressions down to what clothes they were wearing, but the kid remained solid black. They were walking their dog, and even the dog didn't seem to notice, which is odd. I gave up and glanced down to put my phone in my pocket, and when I looked up, the figure was gone. It just vanished in that second or two of looking away. At this point, I was getting really confused and just wanted to get home. The creep factor was through the roof. I turned around and began to walk back when all of a sudden, fast-paced running was coming up behind me. Startled but trying to keep my composure, I quickly turned around and saw this gray blur just zoom past. The thing that stuck out the most was for sure the very gray skin and what I swear were black eyes from just the slight bit of eye contact that I had. It was a kid. Then right as this kid is passing by, he says, ha, I scared you. And boom, dude's gone just like that. Poof. He was moving way too fast for any person. By the time I got home, I began researching what this area has as far as legends go, and I stumbled across BEKs. I guess Texas is very aware of BEKs and has had several sightings, starting from some dude in Abilene who was a reporter. It wasn't until I did some more research and talked to some other Redditors before I became totally convinced that this had to have been a BEK encounter. When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments. So I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such. But many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside. When there was no one there, and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted. And so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being, as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts, and I knew what a doppelganger was, or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge, and I knew that traditionally, a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears over time through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so I deliberately ignored it as much as possible and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, 
I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos, to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body, but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely, caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home, and I walked in, still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier. So I was born and raised near central Pennsylvania. I was a boy scout from the fifth grade until my 18th birthday. This story takes place in the summer of 2007. My dad was the scout master and my brother was the camp master for years at the camp where this story took place. Needless to say, scouting is in my blood and I've always been engrossed in it. During weekend campouts, we would always play jailbreak, cops and robbers, some people call it. One team, the cops, tried to catch the other team, the robbers, to bring them to a central point, the jail. Anyone on the robbers team that wasn't yet caught could run to the jail, touch it, and yell, jailbreak, and release anyone inside. This went on until all the robbers were caught, and then the team switched. We would play from around 7 to 8 p.m. until about 2 to 3 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. Now, for a week in summer, our scout troop would go to a Boy Scout camp in Pennsylvania for a week to get merit badges, to gain ranks, and to gain skills in scouting. Usually, summer camp happened in late June to mid-July. I would also go to a church camp for a week in early June before scout camp. It was when I was getting picked up from church camp, knowing that scout camp was only a week or two out, that my dad took me aside. He told me that one of the kids, Brian, not his real name, was hit and killed by a driver that was texting and driving. The area we live in is rural. I guess Brian was just walking off the shoulder between his parents and grandparents when he was hit. It was a 35 mile per hour zone in a straight road area and the lady that hit him was going almost 55. To my knowledge, she was never charged with anything from the incident. We went to the viewing later that week, and then summer camp the week after. During that week at summer camp, we were at one of the campsites, located centrally. Each site was named after a Native American tribe. We were the only scout troop in the campsite, so we decided to play jailbreak there were eight of us playing that night. At the campsite, there are bathrooms called kiabos that have two stalls and a urinal with a sink, all covered by a roof. This campsite in particular had a steep bank just on the far side of the kiabo 
that you could lay down against and not really be seen in the dark from someone looking down the hill. So our whole team was laying against it, ready to run in all directions once found. We had someone watching behind us, uphill and to our right, as I watched to our left. I noticed somebody watching us from behind a tree. The tree was maybe 30 feet away from where we were laying. The person looked like they were wearing a gray hoodie with the hood pulled up. They were peeking from behind the tree and then ducking back behind it. I said, hey, guys, is that someone looking at us? Everyone looked. Then a flashlight from one of the adults swept across the bank and the tree as they walked around the campfire above us on the hill. As the light crossed the tree, I distinctly saw the tree shadow and no person's shadow connected to it. And yet the person was still peeking out and didn't seem to light up as the light crossed them. As we saw this, somebody yelled, run, run, get the hell up. We ran to the campfire and the other players were looking for us already. They were getting ready to search for us. Turns out, our friend was killed wearing a gray sweatshirt and was one of the best catchers in the game. I like to think he was having one final game with us before he crossed over to wherever we go. For some background, I live in the California foothills. My parents and I moved into this house from the city in late 2017, after it had been sitting empty for over a year. The day we moved in, my mother and I arrived first to clean while my father and brother drove the moving truck. Right off the bat, I was uneasy, but I tried to write it off. The property felt heavy is the only way I can describe it. Some people on here describe the feeling of being watched inside their homes, but I had that feeling any time I stepped outside. We were going to sweep and mop the floors, dust the baseboards and window sills, when I started noticing this white granular powder all along the baseboards and the window sills and the doorways. I immediately told my mother, who told me not to worry about it and just sweep it up. By the time I had swept up every room and cleaned off the window sills, I was certain that it was salt, and a lot of it. But fine, whatever, the people that lived here before were superstitious, alright, I can live with that. We unpacked the truck over the next week. I was setting up my room when the next bizarre events started happening. Knocking on the windows, always quick raps that sounded like someone knocking with their knuckles. It would happen so often, on all the windows in the house, but when you would turn, no one would be there. You'd go outside, and no one would be around the house. This only escalated. My brother would stay up late in his room on his computer every night. He liked to game with his friends until early in the morning. He does not spook easily, but on more than one occasion I would wake up to him shaking me awake, terrified saying something massive on two legs was walking around outside his bedroom window, which he would have open at night. He said it would walk right up to his bedroom window and stop, and when he would look toward the sound, he could hear it scrambling away. I never saw it with my own eyes, and neither did he, but the motion lights outside would be activated every single time, leading to the woods near the back of our property. I know what you're probably thinking. All of this up to this point can be explained away rationally. A crazy person living in the woods, some neighbor messing with us for whatever reason. Well, that was what I told myself too, so I could sleep a little easier at night. And then the banging started. It was so loud and it would sound like it was coming from everywhere at once. The walls would literally vibrate, picture frames rattling right off the walls. It was like something massive, stronger than any crazy person, was pounding on the exterior walls of the house, always late at night, and always in more places than just one. 
I could never pinpoint the source directly. My brother and I would stumble out of our bedrooms petrified, and my mom would lead us to her room where we would stay after that. My dad would walk the perimeter of our property with his gun, but he never found anything. No footprints, no people, nothing. This happened for probably six months, and every time a major event would happen, my dad would walk the perimeters with his rifle and come back with nothing. We felt like we were going insane. And then, suddenly, it just stopped. The mutilated animals stopped appearing. I stopped feeling like I was being watched any time I would go outside. My dogs stopped being so on edge any time I took them out. And the property itself seemed to get lighter, like it finally took a deep breath after holding it for so long. I genuinely have no explanation or even a clue as to what that creature, being, or entity even was. I'm just glad it seems to have moved on. Hopefully it didn't stop because it moved in. I had a creepy experience at the Lizzie Borden house and I thought I'd share. For the record, I don't believe in ghosts and I'm skeptical of all paranormal experiences, but I will certainly admit when something is creepy and can't be easily explained. I didn't go into this day expecting or hoping to have any kind of experience. We stayed in one of the attic rooms, the Knowlton room, which had a large toy chest in the corner. I had no issue with the room, and found it cute and comfortable, but when I went to sleep I had awful dreams all night. It was a hyper-realistic dream. I was lying in the very same bed that I was actually sleeping in, feeling terrified. I was trying to fall back to sleep, but it was difficult because of the strong sense of fear and because I was so thirsty. My throat felt like paper. I wanted to get up and get a drink of water from the bathroom but I was too afraid. I felt that if I opened my eyes, I would see somebody in the room. I lay there for what felt like hours trying to fall back to sleep so that morning would come. At one point, I heard what sounded like a ball go bouncing across the floor. I heard it a second time, and I woke up my friend who was sleeping next to me to ask if she had heard it, but she hadn't and it didn't happen again. I assume that I dreamed this whole part because she doesn't remember me waking her up, but maybe she was just too tired to. Then at some point, I think I woke up for real because I was suddenly aware that I was lying in bed with my eyes open and the fear was suddenly lifted and the room felt completely normal. It was like a cloud had been lifted from my mind, which I sometimes feel when I'm struggling to wake up and I finally pull out of it. I was still really thirsty though. I didn't think much of my bad dream until the tour guide started to mention experiences that other guests had had while sleeping in the house. When we went to the attic, the guide told us that a lot of people who sleep there hear the sound of children playing at night. I asked if anyone had ever reported hearing a ball bounce across the floor. She said, that's pretty common. Why do you ask? She also refused to go into the attic guest rooms. She let us explore, but despite having no issue with the murder room and the master bedroom, she would not go into Knowlton room. This could have just been an act to enhance the to her spookiness, but I don't know. I've also since learned that bad nightmares are very common in that room. For the record, I don't typically have dreams like this. I have no problem sleeping in strange places. I have stayed at many hotels and inns and friends' houses. And while I may have restless dreams, I don't have nightmares, especially not these vividly realistic ones where I'm just lying in bed feeling afraid. I've only had a dream like this once before, shortly after I had moved into my current apartment and was sleeping alone in my new room. No one ever lived in that part of the attic. It was open storage space and was only converted into guest rooms when the house became a bed and breakfast. So there's no reason for why there would be children's ghosts in the attic let alone any ghosts at all. I know the tour guides claim that the attic is the most haunted part of the house, but there isn't really a logical reason for this, 
There were some children who were killed next door, and they claim that those children come to visit, but I don't know. Maybe the atmosphere cultivates bad dreams. I did look at the toy chest before going to bed, so maybe that influenced my dream. But I didn't notice any balls in it, just dolls and stuffed animals. I know a bad dream isn't the most interesting thing, but the fact that many people have had bad dreams in this room is at least a little weird. It's the spookiest thing that I've ever experienced, for sure. I was hoping I might get another independent report of hearing a ball bouncing. I am too skeptical to believe anyone who says, me too, after hearing my story. But nonetheless, I find it neat that I dreamed of a ball bouncing. Despite only noticing dolls and not balls, and not being a person who's overly susceptible to creepy places, and that this fits with other people's reports of having heard children playing. What do you think? Have you ever had any strange experiences at the Lizzie Borden house? I hope to gain some insight, advice, or help about what happened two weeks ago. I'm a little bit familiar with the black-eyed children phenomenon, but I need some help to identify what exactly happened to help two family members who haven't been right since the sighting. In 2013, I moved with my family into a foreclosed six-bedroom home on 14 acres, straight up in the middle of nowhere in the Poconos. My father and I noticed very weird things going on the second we moved in, but my mother and sister seemed not to notice. Everyone other than my dad and I and my entire family are the, oh, it was the wind type of people. I won't go into everything that happened there as it would fall under a different category, but there is some evidence that the entire area of where this house is located is haunted. Now, historically speaking, with actual evidence, people settled here around the old mill area long ago and brutally killed many Iroquois Indians. This area is very spread out over miles of heavily wooded mountains. Two weeks ago, my uncle on my mother's side and his girlfriend came to visit my parents' home. They do this quite often, as my parents always have people over for beer, games, bonfires, and things like that. I just wanted to start off by saying my uncle is a non-believer, a Harley rider who, to this day, I have never seen really get scared of anything or anyone before this. My uncle and his girlfriend are playing foosball with my parents when they realize that it's 12.30 in the morning, so they decide to head home. They take all the back roads, and once they turn onto Running Valley Road, about six minutes from the house, my uncle's girlfriend sees two figures. They were pretty far away at this point, but it was two small figures waiting to cross the road. Just to mention, there was nothing out there. No houses besides one abandoned one that was still two miles up the road. Nothing else. The only thing in the vicinity is a cave. These figures were attempting to cross the road to go into the woods, which was very odd because of the time and location. They are now approaching these figures. Headlights start to shine directly on them. Both my uncle and his girlfriend see two young girls aged about 9 to 11 years old. One is much bigger than the other, wearing what my uncle best describes as early 1900s church clothing, like dresses to the knee with white cotton shawls and cropped sweaters. Weird, right? I mean, what the heck are two 10-year-old girls doing out at 12.30 a.m. in the middle of nowhere wearing church clothing? They also noticed that the bigger child had her arms wrapped around the smaller one, like you would do if she was hurt or scared or cold. At this point, my uncle's girlfriend is like, it's children, we have to stop and help. Now at this point, the truck is almost right next to the little girls. Both had their heads held down. So then, the bigger of the two starts to pick her head up to look at the passing vehicle. Then both my uncle and his girlfriend notice that the girl has no eyes, just black holes, as if they'd been carved straight out of her face. The girlfriend says, What the F was that? You saw that, right? Tur turn around, go back right now. My uncle, scared shitless, takes off, flying to get home. 
They get home and get into an argument because she wants to drive back and see what was up. She grabs her own car keys and my uncle basically was like, you are not going back there. We are never going on that road again. He calls my parents in an extreme panic, tells them, and then they start bugging because they know that he would never lie or be that freaked out if it wasn't warranted. So my mom starts to tell me everything. Mind you, my family knows nothing of black-eyed kids and had never heard of it before. I send my mom an article to forward to my uncle with some of the very basic info. Young kids, no or black eyes, dreadful feeling, sometimes outdated clothing, things like that. Now my whole family is bugging out. I don't know what you guys think. Let me know if you have ever experienced something similar or if you think they encountered something else altogether. During my time at university, I had a part-time job at a huge Bavarian company. The building had eight floors and a quadratic shape with a big lobby hall in the center of the building. It actually was hundreds of years old, but completely renovated. I worked once or twice a week, mainly on weekends. Now here's the interesting part. I worked in night shifts, and my job was basically to walk around the whole building twice a night. While walking through the hallways, I just had to watch out for stuff that people forgot when they rushed into the weekend open doors, open windows, light switches, things like that. Nothing out of the ordinary, and the payment was also really good. In fact, I was kind of surprised about how good the payment was, because obviously I didn't have to do much in those eight hours. My girlfriend and other friends mentioned that the payment is just fair, as I had to walk around a huge building at night, completely alone. They always mentioned how they would never do this, Sometimes my girlfriend would visit me there to bring me dinner. They said that the sinister feeling in buildings like these would play mind games with them. I never had problems being alone. Neither was I paranoid, nor did I believe in paranormal occurrences. Just studied throughout the night and did my two walks. Until this one night in September of 2018. The shift started like any other. I got the keys from the janitor and started studying after my first walk through the building. Between 3.55 and 4.05 a.m., the whole electronic system throughout the entire building resets, which I found really odd at my first shift but grew to ignore it after some months. The janitor explained the reason after I asked. The reset leads to light sources turning on and off throughout the whole building, systematically but still chaotic. I sat at the front desk, not even paying attention to it, when suddenly a certain noise reached me. One of the two elevator doors in the first floor opened itself, closed itself, and then opened itself again. Meh, malfunction, I thought, going back to reading boring scientific papers. After 20 minutes, it happened again, but this time, the light in the elevator switched off, which seemed really odd. At this point, I started to feel a little bit alarmed. When I moved into the elevator, the door behind me closed. I panicked and tried to get out of the elevator, but the elevator even started to take me to the second floor in complete darkness. When I reached the second floor, the door opened and I basically fell out of the elevator door, turning around while I fell. The really sinister looking, completely dark elevator closed again and took off to another floor. My heart was racing and a part of me thought someone manipulated the console, but another part of me felt something else. Fear. I had goosebumps all over my body and I returned to the front desk with a plan to text my supervisor and the janitor about a technical defect in the elevator. I did this with trembling hands when I suddenly heard another distant noise, radio music from somewhere in the canteen. I slowly moved to the canteen with my smartphone light switched on. 
The noise came from the kitchen, and I followed it. Reaching the kitchen, I saw that a radio was playing music on some of the tables. The cooks listened to the radio while working. I froze, and I couldn't breathe. During my first walk, the janitor texted me and told me to put the radio under a certain desk and switch it off, as the cooks would always store it there. I did this directly when I started the shift, even texting him to confirm that I had and to ask where the desk was because at first I couldn't find it. I turned around and sprinted through the canteen directly to an exit and waited outside for the last two hours. Luckily, I had the keys with me when someone for the day shift came. When he arrived, I got into the building with him, took my bag and left quickly. I called myself in sick for the next two weeks. After that, I quit the job using excuses regarding my sleep cycle. Till this day, I have no idea what happened that night. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have, and suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then. I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about 8 to 10 feet off the ground, and the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd, tearing sound for lack of a better word, and each tearing sound was loud and lasted 2 to 3 seconds. I told myself that it was a deer, and that it was tearing bark off trees, and that's what was making the noise, but deep down, I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer, still about 8 to 10 feet off the ground. Now, it was directly behind the tent, within 5 to 10 feet, Right then, I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was, and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted that it was, because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then, things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent, where the ground dropped off steeply, so each few feet forward was also several feet down. 
As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly, and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I had heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. I was a child of divorce and, as such, was often taken by my dad on weekends when I was a kid. He spent most of that time waxing his car at my grandparents who lived out in nowhere North Carolina since he lived in a condo with no hoses to wash his precious. Ignored, my brother and I were typically left to our own devices and wandered the fields and woods around my granddad's land, which was about a half hour drive from civilization. My family owned the neighboring homes and great swatches of land between and behind the homes, so we could pretty much explore out there for hours. All this said, there were some really disturbing things that happened there, and I personally think they're either too absurd or too subtle to have been my childhood imagination. You can decide for yourselves though, and I'd love to hear what you guys think might have been going on. Here are some things I remember. My great uncle was the kind of a jack of all trades. He bought and sold used cars. He also bought wrecks to strip and scrap, dumping the useless husks in a field and the woods up a trail behind his house. My brother and I called this place the car graveyard. On its own, it was eerie, with cars all the way back from the 50s in various states of disrepair. I used to climb inside them until I got into one that was tacky with what might have been dried blood. Sometimes I'd find bones out there, deer mostly, but they'd be in odd places, like skulls on car hoods. My guess is that it was just poachers on his land messing around because he didn't hunt, but who knows. I never saw any with skin or fur. One day, my brother and I were going to the car graveyard, but up the trail to it, we started to hear what sounded like pained moaning up ahead, where the derelicts were. We turned tail that day. Oddest, perhaps, from the car graveyard was the one time we actually went really far back to see just how deep the cars went. It continued into the woods for a while, with trees sometimes growing right out of the wrecks. My brother and I saw something ahead that looked like fog or mist, which reminds me of another story, but that's for another day. We didn't think much about it because we were kids, but this was mid-afternoon and the mist was only in one area. We passed on through and felt inexplicably weird and decided to give up on seeing just how far back it went. When we got back to my granddad's place, things seemed off. It was really hard to explain. My dad looked like my dad and acted like him, but he didn't feel the same. My brother felt this same dissonance too, and we got this wild idea that when we crossed the fog, we somehow stepped into another dimension, maybe just slightly different from our own. Maybe it was just stupid kid stuff, but I still remember how oppressive this feeling of not belonging was. We booked it back across the fog again, and when we came back, everything immediately felt as right as rain. We went back as an adult to that same spot, no fog, but there was a particularly off-putting sensation. A few other odd things happened out there, but not in the car graveyard. We heard laughter coming from a hole in the woods. I swore that I saw the stereotypical sheet ghost near the woods, 
but as soon as I looked, they vanished. I regularly saw a face in the shadows between the trees across the field. It reminded me of Morlock from the 60s time machine. I saw a log truck carrying a bear on its back that was as tall as a house. It was probably some fiberglass thing for a store or putt-putt golf, but it was still a really odd thing to see. I hesitate to add this one because it's just so goofy, but what the heck. One day my brother and I were messing with my granddad's walkie-talkies, and we saw this really odd looking bird in the sky. We joked that it looked like a flying monkey from the Wizard of Oz, and said, flying monkey, flying monkey, come in flying monkey, into the walkie-talkies. Another voice came through and said, someone get me a flying banana. A bit spooked, we went into the kitchen and took a banana to leave it outside, and we stayed indoors for the rest of that visit. When we left, only the peel was sitting outside. That's about all I got for that area. A few things happened inside the house too, but that's not really pertinent to this story. So my grandpa has this ranch about 25 miles east of Payson, Arizona. For those in Arizona, it's between Heigler Creek and the 260. It's very secluded, but the land is good for grazing. I spend a lot of time running Jersey cattle on the range. Every night, one of us rides out to check on the cattle in the field and to check the fence line for holes in the wire. A few days ago, I was riding out to check on the herd at about 1.30 in the morning, and I kept hearing this rustling in the tree line, running along the fence perimeter. I figured it was just coyotes or squirrels. I see a lot of them up there. It went away every 10 or 15 minutes, and then I heard it again. The second time I heard it, I was off my horse and walking him to a little water trough. The cows were about 150 to 200 yards away, just within my view, given the moonlight. I heard the rustling again, but this time it was heavy. My horse Vegas and I both looked up at the same time, wondering what in the hell we were hearing. At this point, I came to the eerie realization that whatever was out there was tracking Vegas and I, and it didn't seem so interested in the cows. In an attempt to scare it off, I got back on my horse and grabbed my whip and uncoiled it. Don't worry, I don't use it on animals. I only use it to make a loud noise to move the cattle along. I cracked it a few times, figured that was safer than using my pistol. The rustling stopped and the forest was dead quiet once more. Not thinking much about it, I went back to count the head. I marked 38 heads, all the cows were there. So I started my way back to the house. I was about three and a half miles away and it's a bit of a trail ride to get back. It was about 10 minutes of silence until I heard that rustling again. At this point, I was getting pissed. I figured it was some dumb little coyote thinking that we were going to lead him somewhere. So I called my grandpa on my radio. There's zero service out there like none whatsoever, so radios are our only communication. I told him I was going to fire my gun so that he didn't get worried when he heard it. I reached down and pulled my revolver from my side and I fired one round into the air. The rustling stopped as the shot rang out through the woods and mountains. My ears rang and the smell of gunpowder filled my nose as the smoke settled. After I calmed Vegas down, I started riding back, only for the rustling to return five minutes later. I started getting really nervous at this point, because usually coyotes run away when they get scared by a loud noise, and they don't usually return that quickly. I didn't have a flashlight on me, because I'm dumb and forgot, so I used the lame iPhone flashlight and dismounted. I slowly walked to the tree line where I had heard the rustling, since I had my gun out, ready for an animal to jump at me or something. 
I flashed my light around through the clearing in the trees. To my right, I heard rustling about a hundred feet away. I looked over, and to my surprise and confusion, I saw a black silhouette of a horse running across the trail. I immediately thought, oh crap, is that one of our horses? Is that someone else's horse? So I got back on my horse and rode over to where I had seen it, shaking with anxiety. I looked around and was confused. I had no idea how that horse had even run into or out of the forest because it was so thick with shrubbery. And when I looked back behind me to start riding back, I stopped frozen in fear and got the chills. I dropped my gun and heard the sound of it hitting the ground because in front of me, about 50 feet away, was the silhouette of a man wearing a flat brimmed hat who appeared to have chaps on. I picked up my gun and aimed at the figure and it was gone. I got back on Vegas and rode like the wind to get out of there, constantly looking behind me in fear of it following. I made it back and told my grandpa. He tried to calm me down and that's when he told me that he had had some weird experiences too. I like to look out for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, about 10 years ago, I'm in western Pennsylvania, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out-of-the-way stream that I had found on the map. I'm in the country, it's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be, so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe the stream is located. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of the trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random places in the road, first sporadically and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It almost looks like they were placed there on purpose. My car is four wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger. Combined with this is how tight the road is now. Driving around them starts to get a little sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly so I don't pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn, but I stop as I see the road continuing down on this weird trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around, but it's also at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but if I didn't want to get my front end caught on something that might be pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck, I just couldn't do it. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you're bound to just get enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it's just garbage, bottles, boxes, wrappers. Then I start seeing toys, 
kids' toys. Lots of them, like an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not like one random mattress, lots of them, all over the place and there are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to get out of there, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out what my next move is, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks all of the way back up and out. I do this until the path levels out again. I was in full F this mode and I just risk making the three point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. Worst case, I don't even wanna think about it. All I know is ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts to tell me to get out, I get out. I was a kid, when I was a kid in the 90s, I would often sleep at my grandmother's house in the middle of a small village in the Jura region of France. The bedroom I would stay in was called the room in the back. As the name suggests, it was one of the last two rooms at the end of a main corridor shaped like an L. There wasn't anything special about that bedroom. It was pretty small and contained a bed, shelves with books and some other very basic furniture. Yet, for some reason, that room creeped me out. I felt an unwelcoming presence, and I would always struggle to fall asleep, scared of whatever invisible forces seemed to be lurking in the dark. One night there, when I was around eight years old, I woke up scared and confused. I found myself lying down on the floor and in total darkness. I feel like I need to make two things clear here. This is the only time in my entire life that I have ever awakened outside of whatever bed or couch I'd been sleeping in. Second, despite the fact that the house is located in a small village, it wasn't particularly isolated, and the street lights outside would always let a little bit of light filter through the closed blinds at night. So here I was, a child, surrounded by total obscurity, struggling to understand why I wasn't in my bed, I tried my best to stay calm and touched around me, hoping to find the side of the bed nearby so I could climb back into it, but I simply could not find it. I tried for several minutes, but it just didn't seem to be there, which was extremely strange considering that the bedroom wasn't that big in the first place. I therefore decided to move forward in a single direction to find a wall, and then I could follow that wall until I found the bed. But things got even stranger as I tried to find a wall. I would bump into furniture that I didn't recognize, and despite all of my efforts, I could not find a wall anywhere. Everything around me was completely and utterly unfamiliar. I thought about calling for help. My grandmother was sleeping in the bedroom on the other side of the corridor, and my parents in the living room. However, I imagined them finding me screaming on the floor and decided not to, not wanting to face that kind of embarrassment. Finally, I fell asleep on the floor, giving up on finding the bed. The next morning, I woke up in that bed under the blankets. It was like the entire event had been nothing more than a weird dream, yet it absolutely did not feel like a dream. I am a natural lucid dreamer, and even back then I was already very familiar with how dreams feel, 
and this just wasn't one. A few years ago, a long time after this strange occurrence, I went to England to visit my aunt, who's from the other side of the family. She claims to be a witch and is into a lot of new age stuff. I've always been skeptical, but I have to admit that she's done and said a few strange things that got me to go from not believing her at all to being a little bit more neutral about it. We were talking about our respective families, and she went on about the only time when she had ever been to my grandma's house when I was a baby. I thought it was a good opportunity to see if she had sensed anything unusual there, and I asked her, making sure to keep the question open so as not to influence her. The first thing she said was, ah, yes, the room in the back. She said it in English and had no idea that we called it that way in French too. There is something wrong with that room, she said. I was spooked. Once I got back to France, I decided to confront my mother about it since she'd spent her childhood in that house. As soon as I asked her what was wrong with that room in the back, she froze and her face became white. She explained to me that when she was little, she went into that bedroom with a few friends and they tried to invoke spirits for fun. They sat down on the floor in a circle, holding hands and said, spirit, if you're here, knock three times. They immediately heard three very violent knocks and ran off screaming. She told me that ever since then, the room had felt weird. That's it. Nowadays, the room is pretty different, but still used as a guest bedroom. It still feels weird, but I'd say a lot less so than when I was a kid. I know my brothers, who are 10 years younger than I am, have also complained about feeling uncomfortable there for some reason, but they never had any unusual experience there. Just a feeling. When I was a kid, I would always feel watched from a very young age, around six or seven. I would refuse to sleep alone for this reason, and I insisted on sleeping with my brother or mum. If I was forced to sleep alone, which was the case most of the time, I would stare into my room and observe the details for hours before finally falling asleep. My first experience came when I was around eight. I went to bed like I would on a normal night. My mom would pretend to sleep next to me and keep me company so that I would fall asleep. When she didn't do this, I would place a large body pillow next to me so that I wouldn't feel watched. I woke up in the middle of the night one night. I would always wake up at around two. But on this night, next to my bed was an old woman that I could see through. I could see all the details, though. She had wrinkles, probably around 80 years old. She had curly hair and wore a buttoned sweater with stripes. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran out the door, next to her. My dad picked me up and let me sleep in their bedroom. It would only escalate from here. Almost every night from this point on, I would see a cloud shaped like a human standing next to my door when I woke up in the middle of the night. Keep in mind, I would always wake up at around 2 a.m. with no exceptions. It would disappear after 30 or 60 seconds and kind of just dissolve and float up into the roof. I could move and speak, so it was not sleep paralysis. One night, it spoke with me in a woman's voice. I was sleeping when I woke up to the voice saying, Hi. I thought it was my mom, so I hesitated to even open my eyes at first. But then, I was greeted by the figure standing at the door once more. I tried saying a few words, but no response. If I had to guess, I saw this figure at my door every night for months, maybe years. The vibes I got every time I went face to face with it were terrible. I was absolutely horrified. It's hard to explain, but it felt like the thing in front of me was evil. If I remember correctly, it was not 100% stationary. The mass or body of the thing was moving slightly, sort of hovering in position, if that makes sense. My brother reported a female voice whispering, good night, in his ear one night as well, 
which is super scary. At this stage, sometimes things would fall down in my room at night, and my parents would come search it but find nothing. My brothers, one remains skeptical till this day, started reporting heavy footsteps when they brushed their teeth at night. They would go and check, find nothing, go back to brushing their teeth, then hear the footsteps and repeat. Hearing heavy breathing right next to me at night also happened a few times, stopping when I turned on the lights. One night, where my brother and I were relaxing in the living room, we spotted a figure walking back and forth right outside our window, maybe five meters away on the grass. It was a summer night, so it was fairly bright. It was shaped like the person I always saw, but this figure was black and not the cloudy type that I would always spot. It walked back and forth for minutes. We called our dad over, but he couldn't see it. Only my brother and I could. One particular incident made me call it quits and beg for help. I was sick and home from school. My mom was going to the bakery, so I would be home alone for a little while, which I hated. I went to my brother's room and started playing some Counter-Strike. After a few minutes, a large sculpture that my brother had made at school fell down onto my face. I got scared, opened the door, and across the hallway I saw the cloud figure at my own room, exactly the same spot I saw it every night. This time, it moved quickly toward the kitchen, at a pretty fast pace. I jumped out the window and waited for my mom to come home outside. I had never been that afraid. I get chills just remembering it. At this point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I begged for my parents to find someone that could help. My parents, who had witnessed nothing alarming, didn't share the same desire, but agreed to do it. I could not be present when he was here. I was, quote, too young. But he claimed that three entities lived in the house and gave us some details as to why they were present. From that point on, I never experienced it again. I wouldn't feel watched anymore. I could sleep alone, and I never saw anything again. I don't know what the hell that was, but I'm getting curious now, now that some years have passed. So, if anyone has any ideas as to where these things come from or what I experienced beyond what I've told you and what I know, I would be anxious to hear it. Before I tell this story, I just want to preface it by saying this isn't scary. I've never believed in ghosts, and even after all of this, I still don't believe in ghosts. With that said, a part of me wants to believe that none of this is coincidence, and I still thought that whatever it was, it was worth sharing. In the spring of 2019, my grandpa was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. When he found out, he gave my mom an acre of his land where an old barn used to be. A car and some tools and other valuable stuff was there too. A few months after he was diagnosed, we all knew he was close to his last day, so the whole family gathered at his house to be with him in his final moments. The moment he passed away, the light in the living room flickered. We all noticed it, but nobody said anything about it because we were preoccupied with hugs and crying. After that, we shared memories, talked for a while, and went home. We all met up there the next day since we kind of just wanted to be around our family while we mourned. After saying hi to everyone, I ended up sitting next to my great aunt, my grandpa's sister, and we were just sharing memories. At some point, she brought up the lights flickering right when he passed, and as soon as the word flickered came out of her mouth, the lights flickered again. We all looked at each other in amazement, and then she said, Brad, if you're watching over us, please give us a sign. And sure enough, the lights flickered again. Those of us who were there all kind of laughed, and I felt a wave of relief, as it was the first time I'd heard anyone laugh in days. We went about the rest of our day as normal, and I went home. My mom, grandma, younger sister, and a couple of my younger cousins decided to stay the night. Apparently, at some point in the night, my grandparents' radio turned on at full volume, 
playing a tape my grandpa had of his favorite radio show from back in the 50s. I'm sure they thought it was weird and related it to my grandpa, but apparently they just went back to sleep. Later that night, the TV turned on with my grandpa's favorite show from his childhood, American Bandstand, turned on, which he also had a CD or recording of. This woke everyone up, and apparently it made my mom and grandma cry. They think it was my grandpa letting them know that he's okay and that he's watching over them. That was the last strange thing that happened for a while. About a year later, my grandma decided it was time to move out. So she had an estate sale and sold the house to a single mom. It was hard for her to let go, but she was happy knowing that it was going to a family in need. As far as I knew, everything was going good there until my mom decided to sell the acre of land that my grandpa had given to her. I recently got my real estate license, so they asked me to list it. But to go ask the woman who bought the house if she wanted to buy it or do a land contract before I put it on the market. I didn't have her number, so I went to her house and knocked on the door. When she opened it, I explained who I was and asked if she wanted it. She thanked me for the offer, but declined. She said that she would, but that she's trying to move out of the house as soon as she can. Looking at her as a potential client, I started to question where she was looking to move, and I asked why she wanted to move. She seemed hesitant to tell me why, but I asked her if there was anything wrong with the home. She told me that she has heard footsteps and other weird sounds in the house, and that she just needed a change. I thought it was weird that that was enough for her to want to move out, but I brushed it off. I got her number and told her that I'd be happy to help her sell the house and help her find a new home. She's still living in the house, but as we've talked more, she has opened up about why she's moving. Apparently, she's heard what sounds like a man crying in the basement about a dozen times since moving in, and it scares her kids so badly that they started sleeping in her room every night. She's tried figuring out what makes the noise, but the sound always stops when she opens the basement door. I've thought about asking my grandma if she's ever heard that noise before, but I'd hate to make my grandma think about something like that. I'm still working with this woman and we have just listed the house, so I'm hoping that once she gets a new place, her kids will be comfortable again. Now, like I said in the start, I still don't believe in ghosts. I have been an atheist since I was a young teenager, and I always chalk everything up to something logical. Maybe the tapes playing in the night were someone accidentally rolling onto the remote in their sleep. Maybe the sounds are pipes or something. Maybe the lights flickering was because it's an old house. I definitely like to believe that it's my grandpa communicating, but that's just not me. This would all have taken place roughly 10 to 11 years ago, over a period of two years. We had moved into this older house in Abu Dhabi, UAE, after living in another house in the city for two years. It was a creepy house, very normal and in a pretty populated area that was gaining more popularity. The house was quite old, built well on the outside and made from concrete, but was showing its age on the inside. I never felt anything weird about the house, just annoyed at how often a pipe would leak or paint would need to be touched up. However, I very vividly remember two moments in that house. First, I was sleeping in my sister's room with my sister and mother. I must have been around 10 years old, with my sister being five. I didn't like sleeping alone and neither did my sister, so we often shared rooms with our parents. I remember randomly waking up in the middle of the night, no idea why, and after a few minutes of lying there awake, I heard a surprisingly loud female scream. It scared me. I woke my mother and said, did you hear the scream? To which she responded, it was probably just the cats. There were many stray cats that lived in the area, but I knew that it wasn't the cats. It sounded as though a woman was screaming briefly. 
and it definitely sounded as though it had come from inside the house, and it wasn't our cat because he was asleep with my dad. I eventually fell asleep again and didn't bring it up again, and I never found out what it was. Secondly, one night I was lying in bed with my dad. My mom was in another room with my sister. I was trying to fall asleep, and my dad was reading a book. We then both heard what sounded like a large plastic container being dropped. My dad and I got up to investigate. My sister and mother were asleep, and there was nothing noticeable that had fallen. My dad explained that it was probably our cat that had knocked something over. We went to bed, and the next day I basically ignored the experience again and didn't talk about it. But we never found any signs of something that had fallen over. After two years in the house and no other events happening to me, we moved to another house in the same area. It was newer and bigger. Nothing happened again. But a few years later, I bring up my story to my mom one day who then reveals that I wasn't the only one to experience strange things in that house. She explains how one night, when my sister and I were sleeping in our own rooms, my dad had gone to bed to read a book, while my mom stayed in the living room to finish a cup of tea. My dad was lying on his side reading, when he vividly remembers feeling my mother get into bed with him. He even said, you finished that tea quickly, but when he turned around, no one was there. My mother was still drinking tea in the living room, and my sister and I were asleep in our own rooms. He struggled to fall asleep that night. Another time, my mom's friend had come over to meet my mom and see the house for the first time, while my sister and I were at school, and my father was at work. My mom's friend, we'll call her Linda, was sitting in the living room while my mom made coffee for the two of them. Linda then sees my father walk up the stairs to the second floor. She greets my dad, let's call him John, with, Hey John, good to see you. My mom comes out of the kitchen with coffee and questions as to who Linda was talking to. Linda says she was greeting my father, but my mother explained how my father was at work and no one else was in the house. Linda was adamant that she saw a man walk up to the second floor. She and my mom go upstairs to check and find no one there. Linda left immediately and it took a few months before she ever came back. Finally, the scariest of them all. My mom was watching my sister while I was at a friend's house and my dad was at work. My sister was playing in her room while my mom read a book in the same room. My mom got up briefly to go to the kitchen and pack some stuff away. When she gets back, my sister is coloring with some crayons. My mom's confused as she always keeps the crayons on the very top shelf in a cupboard with the door closed because my sister went through crayons crazy fast. She asked my sister where she'd gotten the crayons, to which my sister replied, the man gave them to me. My mom was alone in the house and had left my four-year-old sister alone for only about two minutes. This freaked my mother out a lot and for years she never told anyone about it. After moving out, many of our friends told my parents how they disliked coming to our house. They couldn't say why, but said that it had a strange feeling to it. And my mom never told me about the incidents, as to not scare me. Ten years later, we haven't experienced anything ever again, but we all still very much remember and dislike talking about that house. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. 
and I mean there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours, and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air, and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're going to feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was going to go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side. Like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner, and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow, my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw. But he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her, and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes, but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad. But if any of you have a clue of what I might have seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered.
I moved into my house about seven months ago, and it was a disaster. I'm not the richest person, so there was a deal struck, and I cleansed the house from the previous tenants. I hadn't seen the place before I moved in. It was a desperate situation I would rather not dive into. When I moved in, there was expired canned food and expired candy waist high from the living room to the kitchen. Literal crap was all over the floor. It was bad. There was a coal stove. It was a very old rigged together house. So the first thing I noticed was that in the basement, there's a tunnel that was dug out. It has a small turn, it's not very long, that leads to this small, circular, tiny room. That's the only way I can explain it. Maybe a small child could stand up in it, but I'm only five foot two, and I couldn't. All that's there is a light hanging from the middle of the ceiling. This is all just rock and cement. The only way that I can explain the light is like in the Brave Little Toaster, when they go to the store with the other appliances, that big lamp that sings, it's kind of like that. It's like a pendant light. Then I was using Facebook Messenger. I was sending a video of me playing my game on my laptop to my friend. It was only on my phone. It took up all the screen, even my time and notifications. I checked all of my Facebook stories and opened tabs and nothing, but this weird footage cut through my recording. I still have no idea where this is. I've never seen it before. It didn't appear on the computer, only on my phone. The video clip showed this marigold colored building and a couple of other places that I've never seen before. It was nowhere, anywhere on Facebook that I could find. So my 15 year old son and I were setting up the attic for his room. He had recently decided to move up to the attic. It was always used for storage. There's a tiny cubby hole that we were clearing out. To the far left wall, the small end of the wall was carpeted. Thinking that was really strange, I ripped the carpet down and found boards, and there was a crack in between two of them. So I used the flashlight and looked inside, and there was a whole other room, bigger than the cubby hole that we were already in. So, of course, the two of us kicked the boards down. All that was in there was wooden shutters, wooden boards, pipes and debris, and a lot of insulation. I saw a piece of wood that looked strangely smooth and out of place, so I flipped it over, and it was a Ouija board. I've done some research since, and it's a 1939 William Fold mystifying oracle board. I did not find the planchette with it, but I did find this weird triangle thing made of wood. It had some runic stuff on it. My 15-year-old son said, screw this, I'm out, and left me there to be possessed by myself, I guess. Since then, I have put the board on the mirror of my dresser as a decoration. Everybody keeps telling me to get rid of it and burn it. I don't want to. I don't feel anything evil from it. I kind of really feel a connection with it. I'm not trying to be all Reagan Captain Howdy here, but it's the truth. I also forgot to mention the weird things that have been happening. Normal things, like toys going off, or things missing and reappearing. Recently, my friend and I, who is here frequently, have been seeing things. People. I saw a man. Twice. I chalked the first one up to my mind playing tricks on me. It was a split second. He was there, I looked at my phone, and he was gone. But a week later, I was driving down a dark back road that's really windy. I live out in the boonies, where there's nothing but woods everywhere. I was driving and, of course, paying attention because I had my son in the car. Not that I don't pay attention when it's just me, but you know. And there was nothing there. But when I looked in the rearview mirror, and I looked three separate times within the span of a few seconds, not ten feet away was a man slowly walking away from the car, in the middle of the side of the street I was driving on. I would have had to have hit him, but like I said, nothing was there. He came out of absolutely nowhere, 
and there's no way he could have been there that fast. Not as close to the car as he was. He had a fedora or bowler hat looking thing on and what looked like a suit jacket, and he was walking very slowly. I saw him three separate times when I looked in the rearview mirror, and then he was gone. My 12-year-old son says that he didn't see him, and he didn't see the other man either. So I guess I really don't know what to do with all of this information. I guess what I really want is information as to what could be going on in this house. So if you have any ideas, let me know. A few years ago, my mom went on a solo road trip. She doesn't usually like to travel alone, but I was in college and she wanted to visit some family a few states over. The trip went well, up until the last night on her drive back home. She had booked a room in a B&B that looked really nice online, but everything went off the rails when she actually arrived, which I witnessed since I was on the phone FaceTiming her, being informed with texts and photos and so on for almost her entire night. When she pulled up to the house, it was totally dark. There were no lights on inside and it seemed almost deserted. When she called the B&B to say that she had arrived, she was told to take a key from under the doormat and unlock the door herself, as the innkeeper had been caught away in an emergency and she would be the only one there for the night. She was already a bit uncomfortable with the situation, but went inside anyway, since she had already paid the fee and didn't have anywhere else to stay. The interior was old-timey looking, with velvet drapes, thick dusty carpets, shelves full of photos and trinkets, and, weirdest of all, many decorative plates with babies and children painted on them all over the walls. My mom locked the door behind her, and went upstairs quite quickly, since she was feeling scared. Upstairs was worse, though, with the continued vintage furnishings and the unfortunate addition of about 15 ceramic dolls in each room, arranged on the beds and propped up on the tables and shelves. At this point, my mom was really freaked out, but kept trying to convince herself that there wasn't actually anything scary about the inn or the dolls or anything else there, so she picked a room and started trying to go to bed. She did find herself turning the dolls around in her room so that they faced the wall, even though she's usually a stark disbeliever in anything paranormal. That's when everything got really strange. She started hearing sounds all over the house, very human-like sounds. It started with creaking, then footsteps, and then whispering. My mom was overtaken with fear in a way that she had never experienced before. She found herself frozen in place, where she quite literally couldn't move, whilst hearing more and more activity. The sounds eventually escalated to screaming, crashing, and banging sounds from all over the house. After a few minutes, my mom managed to shake herself from her paralysis and realized that she needed to get out as fast as she could. She was so terrified that she actually tried climbing out of the window on the second story, but the roof below was too steep and she had to climb back inside. Then she took a fireplace poker, since she said she didn't know if the noise was from some robbers or something, gathered up her stuff and ran into the hallway and down the stairs. She was quite shocked to see that everything was exactly as it had been when she came in except for one thing. A single one of the baby plates had fallen from the wall and shattered on the floor. There were no people in the house. The door wasn't bashed in. All the furniture was in the same dusty spots as before. She booked it for the door, threw it open, dropped the house key somewhere in the front yard, and drove away. She had never been more afraid in her entire life and had never been less sure in her opinion that ghosts were fake. 
She drove around the town for a while and ended up in a Motel 6, where she probably slept for 45 minutes and then came home. Unfortunately for her, though, that isn't where the story ends. She had been looking forward to arriving home so that she could finally be done with the whole frightening occurrence, maybe get some sleep, and watch some reality TV that had been recorded while she was gone. What she didn't account for was the ghostly hitchhiker that seemed to have followed her back. That first night home, she fell asleep on the couch with the TV on. Around 2 a.m., the TV turned off on its own, and she woke up suddenly to hear loud footsteps running through the living room. She lives totally alone in a standalone house. Weird things continued to happen for about two to three months, including a constant problem with the TV turning on and off, changing volume, or changing the channel by itself. She would hear voices, screams, and footsteps throughout the house and would often wake up to have items in the kitchen or living room moved around, with no explanation, and in odd ways. The most notable was when the toaster was mysteriously moved to the top of the fridge one night. Fortunately, my mom really dedicated herself to 100% ignoring the ghost and trying to avoid feeding negative or scared energy into it, and after a few months, it all went away. She felt like she knew for sure, though, that it was a ghost, and that it latched onto her that night at the inn. She certainly isn't much of a skeptic anymore. Hoth is a little village near Canterbury and Sturry, out on the old marshes that were once the Wansom Channel. A few years ago in 2014, my landscaping company were called to a job in a beautiful house there. The house was a converted barn and had been bought by the new owners, who wanted some work to be done there before moving in, as is often the case. So the first step was to visit the property and take a look to come up with a price for the job. There was a great deal of land surrounding the property, with extensive gardens that had fallen into a state of disrepair. After visiting the property, I returned, saying that the place gave me the creeps, and that although it was empty and isolated several hundred yards from the next dwelling, it felt like I was being watched. Obviously, everybody laughed at me. I priced the job, which was a big one, and would need us to be on site for about five days, and forgot about the whole thing. As it turned out, we were given the contract for the garden clearance and various tree works, and we booked in for a few weeks' time. When we arrived on site, there was a crew of builders there already, who were working inside the house, and had been living there for a couple of weeks while they carried out the renovations. When we arrived, we said our hellos, and John asked what they thought of the house. The reply was, It's a lovely place, but it's haunted as hell. We laughed and asked why they thought that, and they told us that all night they could hear banging coming from empty rooms. Their tools were being moved around. They heard whispering, and one had even received a phone call from a distant voice that he couldn't understand, from a number that was just all zeros. He showed us the call record to prove it on his mobile phone. Interested, but still not entirely convinced, we got on with our work. Joe told us that the back courtyard garden gave him the willies, but apart from that, day one was uneventful. On day two, it was quiet in the morning. Then in the afternoon, I went inside for coffee. While I was there, there were knocking sounds coming from one of the back rooms. Nobody was in there, but it could well have been someone in one of the garden areas knocking against the wooden walls from outside while doing some kind of job. But then there was a sound like wallpaper being unrolled or a poster falling off of a wall, something like that. It came from the hall. Then out of the hall, a shadow shot through the kitchen and out the front door. I was alone in the house at the time. And after looking from every angle, the only way the shadow could have been cast was by the kitchen lights in the middle of the room. But there was nothing there to cast it. I was starting to become a believer. On day three, Paul, one of the builders, was having an argument with somebody on the phone. 
When he hung up, he said, I can't believe that. The driver from the skip company says he won't come here to pick up the skip unless we can promise that there's somebody on site to meet him because he reckons that he saw something here when he dropped the skip off before we got here and he says that it's definitely haunted. When he did arrive, he said that when he dropped the skip off the first time, he knew the place was empty, but he saw somebody moving around in there. And while he was unloading the skip, the radio in his lorry came on with a loud load of static. Day four was quiet, apart from the knocking and banging, which we'd all gotten used to by then, even though it was louder than before, and definitely not one of us messing about. On day five, a guy turned up to put in a new TV aerial, and that involved some wiring being fitted in the back room where most of the noises had come from. A few hours in, he was having coffee with everyone else in the kitchen, and he said that he'd be glad when he was done because that room was creeping him out. He said that he was sure he kept hearing somebody walking around in there, but there was nobody inside the house, let alone in that room. The final thing that happened while we were working there was that another contractor turned up to do some light fittings. He parked outside the house. While he was in there, his van radio came on blaring with really loud static, just like the skip driver had said happened to him when he was there before. A few weeks after we'd been there, the new owners had moved in, and John and I went over to visit them and settle up the bill. John was curious and asked the owner if he was enjoying living there. He obviously read between the lines a little bit. Maybe he'd already been asked about the place by one of the other contractors. And he responded by saying, it's a beautiful house, but I must say, it takes on a completely different feeling at night. It's not such a nice place after it gets dark. We returned to work there a couple more times on smaller jobs. But as the clients were living there full time by then, we didn't spend much time in the actual house itself. On one occasion, we were in the kitchen in the evening, having a cup of tea with the owner, when from the back room, there was a huge crash, like a wardrobe being pushed over. The owner just put his finger up and whispered, please just pretend you didn't hear that. We don't want the children to be scared. We do a lot of work on repossessed houses, no pun intended, and houses going through probate. So I have visited a lot of empty properties, often where the owner has recently died. And in over 10 years, I have never been creeped out by a place like I was that one. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. 
My first thought was, oh, it's an owl or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away. And once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son on the same deck at the same house. We have since moved though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, Hey, there's no star there. It zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise. If I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Ear Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m. near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23 heading south toward Lewis Center 
when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, it's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then, as we're coming over the precipice of a hill, just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football-shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish reddish plasma, almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razor, but the phone just would not pick it up at all even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasts it away in the blink of an eye leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the wow signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft. I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed, leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. 
All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird. But again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car, and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console, and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to 10 miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. Growing up, I had seizures every now and then when I would fall asleep. I wasn't diagnosed with epilepsy, but for some time, I was having them until I finally grew out of my late teens. Due to being able to choke and hurt myself when I would have an episode, my parents placed a baby monitor in my room. Also, my room was connected to my brother's through our bathroom. It was basically a short hallway, and we can see each other's beds from each other's rooms. Both of our doors were always open when we would go to sleep just in case if my brother needed to be there for me. Now, on another side note, I saw the movie Dark Skies, so you guys can have a better understanding of this alien that I encountered. The movie alien species, I believe, are supposed to represent the greys. They're a species of alien that are known to have telepathic powers, and even be to the point where they can alter people's memories of certain incidents. In the movie, the alien is causing the family's son to have horrible nightmares. In a sense, to break the family down emotionally, maybe so that the abduction would be easier. Anyway, I don't think this encounter had to do with an abduction, but more in the sense to just torment. So, I'm probably around 12 or 13 years old when this took place. My brother was about 16 or 17. One night, probably about an hour before my brother and I would have to wake up for school, I woke up to my brother walking down the bathroom hallway into my room. I remember just randomly waking up to him walking toward me. When he got into my room and there was more light from my nightlight, I saw that he was crying. He told me that he had a dream that he found me dead in my bed from having a seizure. He said that it was so vivid and surreal that he had to come and see me to make sure I was okay. Now at that point, I'm a little freaked out, and I call into my baby monitor to get my parents upstairs. When my parents come upstairs to see what was going on, they decided that him and my mom would go downstairs and get ready for school early. Now for some reason, I remember that we ended up in my brother's room, my dad and I, because there was still an hour to sleep before the day started. And my brother's bed was a real-sized mattress that could fit both my dad and I comfortably, and he wanted to stay with me. At some point, my dad falls asleep, but I stayed up for a little bit longer before I completely passed out. Before I fell asleep, I swear I saw a long, gray, ET-looking hand coming from the bottom of my brother's bed. I remember seeing the hand come from underneath the bed, and whatever it was placed it so quietly at the side of my bed 
literally a few feet away from me. I don't know if I'm describing this well, but imagine someone laying underneath the bed and they bring around the arm on the side. I remember that when I saw it, I was filled with dread and I was beyond scared, way too scared to touch it to see if it was real. Then suddenly I woke to having to go to school, even though I don't recall falling asleep. For some reason, I never gave a thought about that specific part, about the hand, until I saw dark skies and I had kind of a eureka moment. I don't know if that thing was tormenting my brother with these nightmares or what happened. I don't even know if it's real sometimes, but it was real to me. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience? What do you think it was? Back about 10 or so years ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property. We didn't think much of anything until about 20 minutes later, when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder and we caught quite a few strange things on that. One day before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40 minute drive from the property. So we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled up into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amount of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we heard huge dogs barking, growling, and then saw them running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the general area for a little while longer, just exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in the area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, throwing rocks, but it didn't seem to do any good. I had never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand, and we booked it into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in, and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car, and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have ever been able to explain it, and I have never been back.
This event occurred in early fall of 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it's probably something to do with reading a lot of off-the-grid weirdness on Reddit. Also, some of the details are a bit gray, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs and boggy swamps and other things that were similar to swamps and bogs. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to, you guessed it, the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing ankle deep in water. Then it just got deeper and darker and boggier from there. We mucked about on Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, cooked dinner and just chilled out until it got dark. And it was crazy dark. No other campers around, just the light of our slowly dying fire. We begin to hear a slow splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe 100 feet out from our fire. One of the guys yelled something toward the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and more methodical. This time it was within 15 feet of the fire, but it was out of the fire's light. None of us were really concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured that it was just a deer or a raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly, the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. His light hit something, and he yelled, It's a man! and ran to the swamp burn. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam, and then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out in the darkness. So what did we do? We tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and somehow fell asleep. Nothing else did happen, and we went home the next day as scheduled. We had lots of stories about what it might have been, if it was a real person, if it was a ghost. Thinking back on it now, it must have been a piney, a local who knew the area really well. This man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to come check us out though, so it's still pretty creepy, even if it was just a man. The pines can be great and also eerie, and that weekend was both. So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. 
My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll. Then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace and then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things. So he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll. And so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit that might be lurking inside. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls. They were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So of course some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by. So when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. 
dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe, and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening, and that I thought it was the boy, and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting, and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls, also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asked him what was wrong and he points at the door and says, Mama, who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him. I'm not really sure what's going on, but I wanted to throw this story out there to see if maybe somebody had any ideas. I've had sleep paralysis often for the past three years or so, and when I say often, I mean like three to five times a week. It's always a similar experience. I currently live at my mom's house with my son as I left my son's dad who was extremely abusive. I'm working hard to get back on my feet. I moved in with her last May, so the sleep paralysis happened before I moved back, whenever I was still with my son's father. The current setup of the room that my son and I sleep in is as follows. It's a very large loft room with a half bath and a small living room with a TV. My son has some insane separation anxiety, so he sleeps in the same room as me, and our beds are next to each other in a T-shape. I'm at the top and he's next to me sideways. Underneath the loft is one of my parents' three other living rooms. So every single time that this sleep paralysis happens, I see a young child, similar to the look of my son who's about six. The child has dirty blonde hair and is wearing some old looking dirty clothes, like as if he was a child from the 30s or 40s. I can't ever really see the eyes because the hair on his head is covering them. The child is just moving his hands up and down my right leg, and as he's stroking my leg, he's just staring at me with this huge smile, which has some really sharp teeth. All I think of when I wake up every morning is Cheshire the Cat from Alice in Wonderland. The child always asks me to call his mom as he's stroking my leg, either to call his mom or to get him a bunny salad. I don't even know what that is. And obviously I'm trying to move or scream and I can't. It's always the exact same thing that happens. So Monday night was the last time I had an instance of sleep paralysis. What I didn't know was that my mom was downstairs that night, starting to pass one of her kidney stones. She and I both have a kidney disease where we get infections and stones very often so it's not out of the ordinary for her to be up in the middle of the night. She said it was about 3 a.m. and she could hear someone moving around in the loft, moving from the bathroom to the bed and then moving the bed around. So she walks up the steps but sees that both my son and I are dead asleep. So she goes back down the stairs and hears it again. This time it's right where my bed is 
so she just stays on the steps, listening to the noises of somebody getting on and off my bed, but doesn't see anything. I guess she thought nothing of it and went back downstairs, where she eventually fell asleep. The next morning, she was telling me that she was hearing sounds in the loft, and that's when I told her about my sleep paralysis. She just said, weird, and moved on with her day. I don't know what I'm dealing with here. I don't know if it's just my brain playing with me, or what. I did find out later something very interesting, though. Bunny salad was a thing in the 1930s. Food disguises were popular in the 30s, including pigs in blankets, mushrooms made out of cream cheese, and bunny salad made from a canned pear half. I think it's so crazy that bunny salad is actually something that existed. This kid told me about it multiple times and asked for it, but I had never heard about it before. The whole thing is just so unsettling. I live in northern Alabama. I was out rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of the creek with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag, and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and then, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? 10 minutes go by and I'm walking farther up the creek and damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. Something really did seem off though and I started to feel uneasy so much so that I turned around and headed back to my site. Something about the meow just wasn't right. It wasn't a painful meow, but just a matter-of-fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back, I definitely heard a cat meow. I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat, but instantly I feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something was imitating a cat. I keep focused on getting back to my site and about five minutes later, I hear another single meow. Here's where I realize that things are getting really strange. The meow always sounded the exact same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reached my site and pulled out my drinks and plopped down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time I knew with everything in me that it was not a cat that was following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car there was another long meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and I was really starting to lose my mind. I get my keys and mace out and I put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did. I nearly crapped myself finding the courage to make it to my car. But I did, and I hightailed it out of there, fast. I know that the rational answer is that somebody was out there messing with me, but how did they get back there, and why, 
It's like 200 acres of forest. People don't go back there all that often. I'd have to believe that somebody went back there, sat around and waited for somebody to mess with. And how did they follow me without me hearing a crunch or anything? To this day, I can't explain what in the world happened that day, but something was off. This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free. And they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them. So I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister, and which ones we should give away and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care, it was fun. We have half the bag sorted out. When we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips, my mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass and my mom and I were just taking a break chatting when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me and says, Mama. The movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house now. My parents are religious, so after that, they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal, even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips as it wasn't new and there was no box, I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing.
Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of the house and out of town, and I rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had lots of time on her hands, and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying. The woman, who literally had no life besides trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing a lot of weird things. I would wake up and find her watching me sleep. She stole my sunglasses, killed my fish, etc. She tried bossing me around and trolling me in real life. However, she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch, despite my interest in spirituality and tarot, I actually don't believe in witches or witchcraft, but nonetheless, she claimed to be one. I think the spells work on a belief system that causes a domino effect of either positive or negative things occurring. Either way, no matter. I decided I had had enough of tolerating her BS, and I moved out. That resulted in her stalking me. She turned up twice to my workplaces, staring at me for hours. I reported her to the police. Then she tried to cyberstalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet whenever I got up or turned the light on, it disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. Eventually, it started standing at the foot of my bed. But again, whenever I tried to get up or turn the light on, it would vanish. One night, I woke up to it standing there like usual, but I could see a creepy woman's face on it. It was smiling at me. I told it to F off, and it vanished. For a while, I didn't see the thing, but I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they were coming from. I would find them on my arms, my chest, my hips, my thighs. One night I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something had bit me. Instead, I found scratches on my shoulder and back, like somebody had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me, and I even visited a doctor who just accused me of self-harm. I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out where these scratches were coming from. The last incident occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over onto my side. I felt air on my face. I originally ignored it, until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead-looking woman. She looked wet, like someone had killed her and then left her in water to rot. Her body was coming out from underneath the bed, while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed, and I was too scared to get off the bed. So, like a little kid, I covered my face with a blanket, and I started saying prayers and waited until morning. After that, it never came back, and all the scratches healed. It scares me to think about, but I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time, and was somehow scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, Again, I don't believe in spells and whatever, but whatever it was wanted to pose as a female, and I think it was part of my loser ex-housemate's nonsense, like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something she had sent after me. I don't really know what it was, but I haven't seen it in a long time, so as long as it stays that way, I guess it's all good. It was the summer of 2010, and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite, and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees, and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite, and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, 
I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight and he has darkish skin with white face paint and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush. Now all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me. I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage. He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination, or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite and this guy was dressed to the nines. Headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint, and no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake and that it was his people's land and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. He then starts telling us about native legends and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get-together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather and as I walk away, he shouts, they don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather. But like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously and I wanted to share my experience. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place the dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the pines that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him suddenly disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forestry to camp, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated. But the vibe was always the same. That straight-up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. 
As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44-gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but Dad didn't seem concerned. On a trip when I was a teenager, it got strange real quick. My friends and I were all piled into my dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spikes, so Dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us all out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy, slumped against a log, hat over his face, taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural, uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sad if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday, and even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us get out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we would stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up, as he just drove through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch, still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to my dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt back roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best and dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious as heck about what was going on out there. So, a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual. My mates jumped out of the car but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut was to get out, but I'd spent two hours finding the place, and I was going to explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like somebody could be back at any minute, or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then, my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock. Tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another. Then a shirt. Then a ribbon from a child's hair all sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a women's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off. I rounded up my mates to get out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. And there's no way that anything good had come from having children's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, but he just shook it off, saying that weird stuff happens out there all the time. 
Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area, in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes, but I can tell you that I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father, ever again. So, my dad used to work at this restaurant that was extremely haunted. The building was very old, built sometime in the mid-1800s, and there were records of at least a few deaths happening on the premises, back when it used to be a boarding house. Staff used to complain about cold spots, weird smells, and sometimes something would push by them when there was no one around. But there are two first-hand accounts from my family directly. The first story is my mom's. Well, technically I was there too, but I don't remember it because I was only two years old at the time. It was my dad's turn to open up the restaurant that day, and she had gone with my father to spend some extra time with him while he did prep work. She went to the bathroom and took me with her. As she was washing her hands, she heard three knocks on the bathroom door, evenly spaced. She thought that my dad was playing a joke on her. So she whispered to me, your father has no rhythm, and knocked back in a fun pattern, a rap tap tap kind of a thing. She expected my dad to crack a joke or knock back in a playful way. But instead, the reply was three evenly spaced knocks. After she left the washroom, she saw my dad coming down from the second floor of the restaurant. Very funny, honey, she said. My dad was very confused. He had no idea what she was talking about. To this day, he says that he did not knock on the bathroom door. The restaurant was locked. You don't want customers wandering in before you're open, after all. My parents and I were the only people there. That's the first story. The second is mine. But before I tell it, I'd like to go on a brief tangent and describe the restaurant a little bit better, to give you a better feel for the overall vibe. In general, the interior was always pretty dark. The only windows in the place were at the front of the building, facing the street. And that natural light didn't do much, because the building was very long. The back of the restaurant, near the kitchens, was the darkest place in the whole building, but it always felt the coziest to me. No, the worst area was, paradoxically, the brightest. There was a patio attached to the second floor with an adjoining sunroom, the worst room in the whole building. The rest of the restaurant was very cramped, very dim, very Dickensian. Good old Victorian architectural design the sunroom, in contrast, was very open, very light, and it had a lovely view of the patio and the pretty flower boxes we had out there. And I hated it. Standing in that big, empty room, you could just feel all of the space behind you, and you always had this unsettling thought that something was watching you. I used to hug the walls a little whenever I was in there, because that way nothing could stand behind me. I mention this because my story happens on the second floor. There was going to be a fundraising event on the second floor, and I got recruited to help out. My mom had me running around, putting up decorations, cleaning the works. Normally, I was scared to be on the second floor at all, but it wasn't so bad because I was with other people and I had a job to distract myself with. It was actually the first time that I had ever been up there and had fun. That didn't last long, though. The first strange thing that happened was a painting went flying off the wall. And I do mean flying. It didn't just fall. It went a good few feet horizontally. Of course, this was spooky, but we all just rationalized it, put the painting back on the wall, and kept working because people were going to start arriving in a few hours. Once the event got started, that was when the real trouble began. One of our friends, Sally, went into the second floor bathroom. 
When she tried to leave, the door wouldn't open, even though it wasn't locked. At this point, she got a bit nervous and knocked on the door, hoping that someone on the other side could help her get it open. And that set something off, because suddenly the entire bathroom erupted into loud banging. It was a commotion. People outside heard, including me, and we all gathered around the bathroom door to try and get her out of there. We had her lock and then unlock the door. We jiggled the doorknob. We even tried forcing it open. Nothing worked. Inside, what was muffled banging to us sounded deafeningly loud to Sally. It really freaked her out. We were only able to get the door open once the mysterious noise had stopped. Weirdly, we had never had any issue with that door sticking before, and I don't think we had one after. Sally put on a brave face, but it was clear that she was pretty rattled. In private, she later confided that it was one of the most frightening things that had ever happened to her. Later on, after all the guests had left, I was helping clean up. We had a small stand of necklaces for sale set up on the minibar. A pendant in the middle started swaying forwards and backwards, like someone had flicked it with their finger. The rest of the necklaces were perfectly still. My mom saw this too. We both looked at each other and quietly decided that it would be best to not make a fuss and to get out of there as quickly as possible. I think that night set a record for the most unexplained events that had happened in the entire restaurant at once. It closed down a few years later, was mostly torn down, and was rebuilt. I don't know if the new building is still haunted or not. So back in 07, I was eight years old. My grandparents and I lived up on a mountain in northern Georgia in Floyd County, and our property was against the Bartow County line. It's a warm September night, just a couple of days after my birthday. I'm up in my room playing Call of Duty on my Wii, and my grandpa walks in and asks if I can take the trash out before it gets too cold. I say sure and pause my game and slip my shoes on. I walk out into the garage and open the garage door to throw the bag into my grandpa's truck. I turn on the light on the outside of the garage and walk to my grandpa's truck. Me being eight years old at the time, I was afraid of the dark, so I kind of sped walked and threw the bag in and hoped to make it. However, I did not make it, and I heard the bag land on the ground behind the truck. My head drops and my heart starts to pound for some reason. Like I know that if I go behind the truck, something will get me. You know, the basic eight-year-old paranoia. So I run to the back of the truck, pick up the bag and toss it in, and turn around to go back into the garage when I see something. The way my driveway is, it turns off a gravel road, then curves to the left and up a hill. The hill smooths out a little bit, but doesn't level off completely. Right where the hill gets less steep, I see a dark figure just standing there. In the light coming from the garage, I can just make out its silhouette. It appears to be a person at first, but then my eyes adjust and I can vaguely make out hair covering its entire body. I stand there frozen with fear, like if I turn my back it's going to sprint up and get me. So I hesitantly walk backwards toward the garage while keeping my eyes fixed on it and it seemed that every step I took, it took one also. I finally reached the hole where the garage door is placed and ran as fast as I could inside. When I got inside, I ran into the living room for my grandpa, and I say, Grandpa, get the gun. There's something in the driveway. It's big and it's walking on two feet. I don't know what it is, but it scares me. So my grandpa got the gun and we go outside on the front porch, which is a good 40 yards closer to the part of the hill that I saw it on. And it's not there. My grandpa says, you sure you saw something? I don't say anything. I just nod. He drops the gun from the shoulder and says, come on, you haven't put the new trash bag in the can yet. 
We both turn around and walk back inside. Several hours go by and nothing else happens, until about 1 a.m. I wake up from having a nightmare of what I saw. I lay in my bed and look at my curtained windows, and I can see that the front porch light is on. I find that safer because it acts as a sort of nightlight for me. So I'm laying there looking at my window when I see a huge shadow walk right in front of my window on the outside. And I mean huge. The window sat about two feet off the ground, was about four feet tall, and was about two and a half feet from the ceiling. And this shadow was tall enough to cast a shadow big enough to where it looked like someone was sliding a wall past the window. I could hear the boards creaking out on the front porch and could see how wide this thing was from a side view. This thing, whatever it was, was at least two feet wide from the side and it was absolutely huge. I didn't want to go get my grandparents because I didn't want them to get mad for waking them if there was nothing there. So I just watched this thing walk back and forth past my window and before too long, somehow I fell asleep. Fast forward to the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. I had moved off the mountain, but was still going to the same school. Anyway, like a week before school got out, my best friend Kevin and I thought that it might be a good idea to go up to the mountain and to see if we could find this thing. Maybe it was still there. Without hesitation, I jumped at the opportunity. So the following weekend, after school ended, I met up with him and we brought some camping gear, along with some food, and a 30 odd 6. I tell him we can camp out at the house that I saw this thing at, and he agreed that that was the best place to start. So we make it to the night and he's like, let's get out and walk around. I say, okay. So we both get out of the tent. I instantly felt like I was being watched. I shouldered the rifle and I felt the adrenaline filling my veins. Kevin put his hand on the barrel and lowers the end of the gun to the ground. Don't do that, he said. You'll make me nervous. So we start walking around the woods. We find some small game paths and hear a few noises, but we don't really find anything. So we both look at each other and decide it's not worth it, so we start walking back to the tent. This walk will take us at least about 30 minutes. On our way back, we can hear things in the woods that sound like tree knocks and whoops. We get about a hundred yards from the property that we're camping out on, and suddenly a rock flies through the woods and lands within 10 feet of Kevin and I. Then it's like it just unloaded on us. Rocks were landing all around us with almost no time in between impacts. We hear all sort of whoops and hollers coming from different directions, almost like we were being surrounded hunted. I tell Kevin to run that I'd be right behind him. So we start running toward the property and hear the trees snapping behind us. I stop for a split second to raise the gun and fire a warning shot into the air. And then all went silent. Kevin stops just in the clearing of the property and looks back at me. I looked back at him and we both run onto the property and book it out of there as fast as that pickup truck we drove would take us. I haven't been up there since, and I don't intend to return. I have spent decades in the military intelligence community so I don't want to put too much information out there about myself on a public forum. However, I'm curious if there are any other experiences that overlap my own. We lived off base in this rundown community that looks like any other rundown community you would find next to a military installation. The apartment complex itself was nice by the standards of the rest of the buildings in our area. At about 12.30 in the morning on a Friday morning, I was woken up by a series of knocks on my heavy wooden door. I have a rule. One series of knocks is just people messing with the neighbors, but if they really need something, they'll knock twice. Yep, there came the second series of knocks. I expected it to be someone from work trying to get a hold of me. My cell phone had died. It had happened before. 
I opened the door and stared down at this kid that I estimate to have been somewhere around six years old. There was so much about this kid that was just bizarre. The eyes feature suggested in BEKs seems kind of trivial. I can't say with 100% confidence that his eyes were all black. I just don't know, because the rest of him was such a mess. When I look at people I don't know, I have a habit of avoiding eye contact. The rest of his description is as follows. His clothing was a gray, filthy hooded sweatshirt, with the hood up halfway, with matching sweatpants. The shoes were unremarkable. The skin complexion, for lack of a better phrase, was extremely pale. I don't know if there were blemishes in the way of freckles or scars on the skin, or if he was just really dirty, but there were some marks. His hair was possibly reddish brown, messy, dirty, and short. His face was in this grimace of hatred. His expression was like somebody who was sucking on the world's most sour candies. And here's the worst part of it. The body odor he was radiating was like something I have never smelled before or since. I've smelled decomposing bodies in war. The closest smell that I can relate to was in ranger school. In ranger school, due to the lack of food and rest, often the guys' bodies would start to consume muscle for energy. Combined with the lack of bathing opportunities, this creates an odor that is hard to top. But this kid's smelled like weaponized foulness. I asked, can I help you? In a flat voice, void of inflection, he said, my parents don't like you. I responded, uh, what? He stated, you'll be okay if you give us something great. I slammed the door on him because I thought he was just screwing with me. He let out this, no. I could hear him on the other side throwing a tantrum, like you see toddlers in the store doing when their parents won't let them have something. Definitely a very strange thing to do at midnight. However, kids running around the dilapidated neighborhood unsupervised was a pretty common occurrence. I just chalked it up to bad parenting. I showered and threw my clothes out because I didn't want that stench on me, and I went back to bed because I had to be up again in four hours. Strangely, the stench didn't seem to linger. It's like it went with him. I saw this kid on three other occasions. The second time, I was going out to my car in the morning, and he was standing in the parking lot glaring at me. When I came home, he was staring at me, standing in the same spot. Then when I looked out the window hours later, he was still in the same spot, glaring with that same sneer at nothing. I asked my wife what she made of him, and she said he wasn't bothering anything, which was a pretty low bar for that neighborhood. Kids would often run around vandalizing people's vehicles and apartments. I thought about calling the authorities, but what was I going to say? There's this weird kid. He might need help because he's weird. Oh, and he stinks. The truth is, I hated this kid. Now, I have three kids of my own, so I don't just out and out hate other kids, but I hated this one. I hated his smell. I hated that he existed. I felt like he was trying to target and bully me for some reason. No, I didn't want to help this kid. Also, I had these paranoid thoughts of, if this kid hates me as much as I hate him, he's going to lie to the cops and tell them I had harmed him. It could affect my security clearance. It's best to just ignore him and this will all go away. One time, I saw him interacting with kids outside, so I knew he wasn't just a figment of my imagination. However, he didn't play with them like a typical kid would. This girl would come up and grab him by the arm, and he would just stand there and glare at her. There were kids running around him, and he just stared at them with that grimace, unmoving. My wife wanted me to share this experience that I had back in 2011. At the time, I worked in the office of a regional command. I've read into various truly bizarre government programs. However, thinking about it, I still don't know what to make of this kid. I don't know what to get out of writing this. Maybe someone knows more about this kid or has had other similar experiences. It's certainly not extraordinary, like some of the other experiences that people on Reddit have had. 
I'm not saying this kid was magical or demonic. I don't know. I can't rule out that he was truly just some kind of unfortunate kid. Maybe the right thing to do would have been to get him help. However, I just can't get past the hatred that I had for him for no reason. Between that and the smell, my experience wasn't that bizarre otherwise. What I do know is that I'm fine with never seeing that kid again. Maybe these BEK experiences can be explained by kids just being extra weird. But either way, I'm glad my experience is over. I have a few creepy backwoods stories, and this one may be a little out there. It's more than just creepy woods, and I can't explain it. It could have been some sort of mass hysteria or a group hallucination that lasted multiple days, maybe even shared sleep paralysis, but I doubt it. The story starts like this. About 10 years ago, I'm a cocky little brat, 18 year old dude who thinks he has the world by the balls. The world had me by the balls, I later discovered, and I was with my very serious girlfriend of two years and counting. First time I ever dated a girl, and I really felt like I was in love and could see myself marrying this girl. Thank God that didn't happen, but that's another story. So my parents are really strict conservative Christians. They'd never let me and my girlfriend Caitlin share a room at night. Caitlin's parents couldn't have given less of a crap. They let us drink and we had our own bedroom upstairs. Looking back, her mom was kinda not the best mother, but she was nice enough. One weekend in summer, Caitlin and her parents asked if I'd like to come up three hours north to her grandparents' town for their anniversary. This place is hours away from civilization, as secluded as it gets. See Amish people the whole way up, northern Michigan. I said hell yeah. Her grandparents are wealthy and fun and I knew it'd be a good time but too many people stayed in their big lovely house, so we had to rent a cabin, in the woods. This cabin is at least 20 minutes from the village or town or whatever. Right away it seemed off. It's back in the woods off this creepy, secluded, quiet dirt road. Everything silent. The houses next to us were dead silent and empty. It was just us. I'm not worried about it at all because I have this wonderful and fleeting confidence that alcohol and the possibility of getting some action this weekend will give a young man. PBR and hormones, baby. So I'll skip the daytime activities as they don't matter here. We just had a regular fun time with family. And we returned to our cabin for the night. Our room was upstairs in this sort of loft area. The cabin was oldish and rustic and just empty. Not physically empty, just void of something. The kind of emptiness you can feel. But hey, we're way out in the woods and no one has probably been here in ages. Of course it feels dead in here. That night was when it happened, and I'm positive that I'll miss a bunch of details as I blocked it out of my memory until I saw this subreddit and it all came back. I'm sleeping in this god-awful mattress next to Caitlin, and I drift off and have the most horrible nightmares. They weren't dreams, though. It was exactly real. It was as though my soul was able to move around and interact with the bedroom our bodies were lying fast in, asleep. But I was awake. My body was asleep, but I was somehow completely mobile without a body. The bedroom was dark and the moonlight from the window lit up the center of the room. And there were so many people there, all deceased standing in a circle, chanting. In the center of their circle, I see a little girl with blonde hair, maybe seven years old, and she's in this white dress, almost glowing in the most disturbing way. The people turn to me as they notice that I'm watching and aware. They slowly approach me, all chanting and murmuring. I can't remember the words exactly, but I'm positive they were performing a ritual and sacrificing or murdering this little girl. It was kind of like the scene from Rosemary's Baby, something that I never saw until very recently, by the way. They came at me with their hands outstretched, 
looking dead and rotten. And as they begin to strangle me, I wake up. And waking up is usually when everything goes back to normal. But I wake up and I see the rocking chair is rocking, like flying, as if somebody slammed it. At this point, I'm like, nope, F this. I close my eyes and just pray and hope that the sun will rise. It didn't. I fell back asleep. The next dream goes like this. I'm on a roller coaster with all sorts of people, and it's going straight up to the sky, like into heaven. I'm happy and stoked and cheering, and right before we get through the pearly gates, the roller coaster goes down, straight down, into the earth and into the fire and into hell. And I can hear blood-curdling screams for help. So much agony and terror. It was the most awful thing I've ever experienced. I could feel the burn of the fire and the pain of the screams surrounding me. Finally, I wake up and the sun's up. I am covered in sweat. And I look over to see my girlfriend in the fetal position, shaking and crying. I ask her what's wrong, knowing that I already know the answer, but hoping it was something else. All she could say was, the girl, the girl. I asked her what happened, and she said she saw a little girl in a white dress standing in the middle of the room staring at us and dancing. She claimed she wasn't even asleep. She went on to explain how she'd wake up periodically to see the rocking chair just rocking its butt off. I hadn't even told her what I had seen, and she just confirmed everything, which made everything so much worse. I don't have an exciting end to this story. The next night and the night after, I didn't sleep. There was a Pawn Stars marathon on TV, thank God, and I stayed up all night with the lights on, blasting Pawn Stars to stay awake. I didn't sleep again until the car ride home. Caitlin and I talked about it maybe once or twice and then never spoke of it again. I'll never actually know what happened that night or if I was just crazy. All I can say for sure is I'm never going anywhere near that town again. As much as I'd like answers, I think I'd rather just forget about this one. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I have never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the 10 of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me 
despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost 10 years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick or treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night, up to the old bendy spooky road you take up to the house and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. The scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around, but it still freaks me out to this very day. I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, 
I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this, and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance, and in front of it there was an open, empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees, and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house, to the left, and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something. And right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs, plus there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night I dismissed it as the wind, cliche, I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. It started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed light on it, it disappeared, but the eerie feeling stayed there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day. And on some days I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold and my parents were just whipping me into helping her, but it was no use and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. 
it was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop, and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise, and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window, and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage, and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again, and things got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real, and there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging, and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason. Just to start off, I'm not on drugs and I don't suffer from any type of mental illness, so we can rule that out right now. Weird occurrences have followed my family for years. I'm only going to stick to the ones that can be classified as mimicking, starting from my first memory of it. My brother and I are 16 months apart, him being older. We shared a bedroom in a two-bedroom apartment, living with only our mom. We had those metal bunks that you could disassemble and turn into two toddler beds, with the railing going around three quarters of the bed. Before we got our own separate ends of the room, I had the top bunk and he had the bottom bunk. My brother would cry a lot at night and that's why he got the bottom, so he could easily get up and go see my mom, and vice versa. It was normal for his crying to wake me up. One night I'll never forget though, I woke up to him crying, but he was trying to stifle it, like when little kids are done crying and they're just breathing weird. Well, I heard my own voice calling his name in a whisper. I sat there not understanding what was happening. I slid my arm down the gap between the bed and the wall. I would hold my brother's hand that way a lot of the time. He held my hand immediately, and we stayed like that until the sun came up. He told me that's why he cries at night, because he always hears me, but he knows that it's not. At this point, I was about four, and he was turning six. We never told my mom. When I got older, about 14 or 15, I went through an angsty phase like most girls do. I had long straight hair and was really scrawny. By this time, we were living in a different apartment. My brother and I had bedrooms at one end of the hallway and the doors faced each other, with a bathroom in between. I used to sit on the edge of my bed, and when I did, you could see me in front of my door. On multiple occasions, my brother and mom would see me sitting in that spot, while I would be in the bathroom or the kitchen. They would always be like, your twin is here again, and we would just go about our day because it was so normal at that point. When I was in my senior year of high school, I went to an independent study program. It was almost a daily thing, where I would hear my name being called while I was taking a test. We were able to take a test when you finished a packet, and they were stupidly simple. The voice wasn't the same every time, but the tone was, like a sense of urgency. 
I never said anything, because I honestly thought I was insane. I would look up and look around, trying to see who was calling me, and no one around me acted like they had heard a thing. A year later, I was enrolled in a trade school. I would hear my name being called there as well. I met a girl there who was openly practicing some form of Wicca. We became close. We went to school at night and got out around eight. Close to the end of the course, I was walking her out to the car and from the dumpster enclosure on the parking lot, I heard my name being called. I wasn't gonna act like I had heard anything, but my friend grabbed my hand and told me never to acknowledge it. It really freaked me out. I asked her if she had heard something, and she said yes, that something was trying to be me. Another time, I was at my friend's house watching The Conjuring movie. It was only he and I in the house. We were sitting on the bed in his room with our backs against the wall. Okay, bear with me on this part. In my head, not out loud, I had this thought, but the thought wasn't my own inner monologue. My thought was more of a hearing someone else's voice, but in my head. It was really ugly. To this day, I have bad vibes about it. In a really fast whisper yell, the voice said, look at the closet. My eyes darted towards his closet and at the exact moment, one of the doors fell off. He had normal closet doors, the basic two panel kind. Only instead of the track they slide on being on the ground, his were on the top and the doors hung about an inch off the ground. Seconds before the closet door fell, my friend had jumped. Nothing scary was happening in the movie. He preemptively acted spooked. We turned off the movie and we were both kind of like, what the heck? Things like this were common when we got together and it made us have a very strong bond. We talked for a second, trying to rationalize things. But then I decided to tell him about this ugly voice. He then changed his whole demeanor and said, I heard the same thing, only it was your voice. And I had said it so suddenly that it caused him to jump. The only thing is, I had never said a word. Fast forward to two years ago, 2019. I had gotten a home for myself and I lived with my newborn daughter and her father. It was summertime and he was in the backyard grilling. The sliding glass doors were open, but I have thick curtains that were drawn to keep the flies out. I was sitting on my couch with my daughter, sleeping in my arms while nursing. We had been like that when he went outside and told me to stay put. Usually I would go help him. My house is rather small, so no matter where you are, you can have a conversation with the other person, even if they're across the house. So he and I are talking, and then I hear him say, okay, let's go inside. And I didn't think anything of it. Assuming he was talking to himself or the food, I don't know. He walked in and looked at me sitting on the couch with a look he always makes when he's confused. He asked me how I'd gotten back into that position so fast. If you've never seen a woman breastfeed a newborn, I don't know how to explain the logistics, but there are a lot of them and I couldn't have gotten settled again that quickly. I told him that I hadn't moved and made a comment about my butt being asleep. He was really weirded out and shaking his head. He's very logical and a huge skeptic. Eventually, he was ready to tell me. He said that I had been standing in the doorframe, having a conversation with him face to face, with my arm holding back the curtain. And then I had turned around and walked away when he said, okay, let's go inside. He was ready to give me an attitude for not holding the curtain for him while he carried in the food, until he realized I had never moved. I'm not sure what's going on, but that was the last double me encounter I've had, although I doubt it will be the last. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple 
However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home, and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord, and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior, and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick, and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she'd left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought, and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow, and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book, and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about ten shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's, and one day, she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock, and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it, and I asked her if it sounded like little feet 
or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things, like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house. So I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought, because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans, and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much, and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy, like she did my wife. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap, we went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though and we bought the house. From the beginning, it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold. Not to mention, it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets. And after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom at first, but this went on back and forth back and forth for several minutes. And it was fast, 
It was a very brisk walk. Not to mention, next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening, every night for a few weeks. And I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around, and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now, a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom, noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room, and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up cautiously and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, Every single cupboard door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence. And one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door all the way to a few feet from my bed with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mom screaming. 
Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches. And right there and then, she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it. But even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it. And he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything. But I haven't. At least not yet. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey, and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board, and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, 
so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day, when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day, and I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time and no physical person could have put that dirty, old, ant-infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way.
My grandmother, or Tutu as we say in Hawaii, was the center of our entire family. She has always been the center of my life, and there's not a single day that goes by that I don't think of her, even 17 years after her death. She was of pure Hawaiian descent, and growing up with her as a child was supernatural in the biggest sense. I have many stories to share, all of them entirely true, and I will tell them to the best of my ability. All of them are deeply rooted in Hawaiian culture and spiritual beliefs, so please read this with an open mind. If you are not Kanaka Maoli. I have contemplated whether it was right to share this, but I find that this is my opportunity to share her with the world. She has had many experiences in her lifetime, which I have been gathering from my family members, but these are stories that I have had the honor to experience. I'll do my best to keep them short. Story number one, a fireball visits our home. In the year 1991, when I was just five years old, an akualele, or fireball, visited our home. Being so young at the time, I can only remember bits and pieces, but they have been validated by other family members who were there that night. My tutu and I were sitting in the living room watching television. This also served as her bedroom. There were beds all over the house, as from time to time, relatives would come to stay or sleep for the night. One of those dial switch TVs with only seven channels was our television. My older cousin was in his bedroom, which was near the living room. All of a sudden, I heard my cousin yelling for my grandma. He runs into the living room. Toot, what is that? He points out the window, which was just behind the TV. I sat up and went to the window and peeked in between the jalouses. What I saw, I could never forget. A ball of fire was moving above the mango trees in our backyard. It was literally gliding over the trees and toward the windows. I remember how bright it was. It had a long black tail trailing behind it, with sparks of red flickering around it. It was big, and it was loud. I have never seen something like this before. I thought it had come from the sky. As it got closer, I felt the hands of my grandma wrap around my chest as she pulled me away from the window. Her voice was filled with raspiness, and she shouts, Akualele. She yells to my cousin, Grab the salt. Go now. My cousin runs to the kitchen and grabs a big bag of Hawaiian salt and begins throwing it out of the bag. I remember feeling the big rocks hitting the back of my legs. I slid behind my grandma as the fireball began ducking back and forth between the two windows, as if it was trying to get a look at us. The next thing I remember is her cursing at the thing in Hawaiian. She shouts louder and louder and louder, until the thing stops and explodes right in front of my eyes. It was just one loud pop, and then it was gone. Years later, as my cousin and I were recalling the story, he explains to me that the Akualele was sent to us from another Hawaiian family who lived farther down the road. The grandmother of their family was jealous of my grandmother, as we had recently obtained more land to expand our coffee farm. What I didn't remember was that I fell deathly ill for the next two days and my grandmother only left my side once to go talk to the family so they could come to an agreement. After giving offerings and sharing each other's breath, she returned home to find her granddaughter alive and well, as if I had never been sick at all. Story number two, the Aumakua that saved my uncle. This happened in the year 1995, when I was just nine years old. The best thing about where I lived which was in Captain Cook, South Kona, was that many of my family lived on the same road. I had a girl cousin who lived a five minute walk from our home, past my uncle and auntie's house and through a grove of banana trees and thick elephant grass. Yeah, ouch. I would spend the night there a lot. She was like my best friend. One night I arrived there as the sun was going down. 
She was outside on her front porch, crying. Her sister was draped over her body, and they were consoling each other over something. I ran up to her and asked what was wrong. She says, it's my dad, he's sick. I went up the stairs and was about to enter the living room when my aunt peeked her head out of the bedroom door, warning me to stay outside. I began to cry, as any child my age would do in an unknown situation like that. I asked what was wrong, but could already hear the moans and wails coming out of my uncle's lips. His father was a Filipino man, and he was sitting on his usual rocking chair, this time holding a bowl in his two hands, hovering over it, examining it. I went to him to examine it myself. As I passed the walkway into the living room, I peeked into my uncle's room. My auntie was wringing out a towel over his head. The bed sheets were covered in his sweat. He wasn't moving, and he was barely breathing. His father was holding a bowl of water. In the bottom of the bowl was a thin layer of raw white rice. He points to the two flecks of rice floating at the top of the water. Oh no, no good, no can help my boy, he says in his constant broken English. He looks up to finally notice that I was there. He grabs my arm tightly as if to show me that I need to listen now with the utmost importance. Go to your tutu, bring her now. My boy going make. I ran back to our house and I remember the feeling of my lungs just ripping out of my chest. I ran into the living room and called out to my grandma, Tutu, come, it's Uncle Dicky, which was short for Richard. I ran back outside as my grandmother got up. She took a machete and chopped down a bundle of tea leaves. My grandmother starts up the work truck and we take off toward my cousin's house. My grandmother goes into the living room. My Filipino uncle stays silent. I remember sitting outside with my cousins trying to console them in their grief. We sat on the side of the porch, our legs dangling between the railings. I could hear my uncle muttering in tongues as my grandmother prayed for Almakua to come. Almakua stands for spiritual guardian, which are usually manifested into animals. Every person of Hawaiian descent knows which Almakua relates to their bloodline, and I'm sure many have a story to tell of when they have come to provide aid. Yes, it's true, and it would become true to me now. As we were wiping the tears from our eyes, just a moment to breathe back the sobs, I heard a screech. In front of her house was the unpaved road. There was just one street light over the telephone wires running down the side of the road. I looked toward the direction of the screech and could see a small shadow flying toward the telephone wires. I tapped on my cousin's shoulder and begged her to look. It was a Hawaiian owl, a pueo. It perched up on the wire and just looked at us. All three of us were caught in a trance and a feeling of calm swept over me. That's when another one came and perched right beside the first one. Well, that's odd. They spend their lives in solitude. Maybe they were a pair. Just as soon as the second one came, there came another, and then another. Two sets of two. What a sight to see, I thought. In the midst of what was happening at the moment, we found happiness. My cousin begins to giggle a little as she gets up to tell her mom what was happening. Just as soon as she gets up to turn around, she lets out a small sigh. We look up to see that her head had bumped into her father's chest. He holds his daughter in his arms as she begins to scream. Baby, what is it? What are you all staring at? We stared at him, our eyes as big as a mempachi fish. As we turned around to look back at the telephone wire, the owls were gone. My uncle says to us, don't worry, I saw them too. But how? Just a half an hour ago, we thought he was doomed for death. He tells his family, I saw them in my dream. Up there on the telephone wire, yeah? I look deep into the eyes of one, and that's when I woke up. What is it? Why are you all staring at me? 
Story number three, my grandmother's funeral. I apologize in advance for bringing out two great stories just to hit you with the inevitable fact that my grandmother's life came to an end. It was the biggest tragedy in my life, and for some reason, I can't come to grips with it. Maybe it's because she's still with me. She was the caretaker and kahuna figure of my family, and that didn't end in her death, if that makes you feel any better. Or maybe it confuses you. Well, it was the year 1999 in the month of March when my tutu had passed. My grandfather had died just two months earlier. She died of a broken heart, no reason to live anymore. Her funeral service was held at our local church in Keala Kekua. I spent the whole time next to her open coffin, just waiting for her to move, to say something. Please wake up, Tutu. I still need you, I say. The church was packed to the ceiling. So many relatives, so many friends. She meant everything to everyone. The only one I noticed that wasn't there was my uncle, my father's brother. It was just the two of them, with a string of Hanai, or adopted brothers and sisters, who would carry out the coffin at the end of the ceremony. We were trapped in eternity during the service, but I begged it not to stop. The casket was finally closed, and all the Hawaiian aunts and uncles wept, as it was custom to cry loud enough for the heavens to hear. The men in the family all took their places at the coffin, and lifted my grandmother off the frame all with one spot left vacant. They walked down the small stairs and through the short walkway to the hearse. My father was at the back. My mother, sister, brother, and I were right behind at the front of the line. As soon as his foot left the sacred area of the chapel, I saw my uncles buckle as they dropped the coffin to the ground. They began looking at each other, finding a time to laugh, saying, come on, brah, no get weak on me now. They stooped back down to pick the coffin up. I literally watched five of the strongest men in my entire family struggling to pick my grandmother up. Cries and whispers start floating around the chapel as they attempt over and over to raise her coffin off the ground. It would not move. They could not move her. My father explained that the coffin was heavier than blue rock my father and my uncle lean down at the front of the coffin and peek open the door that was to be forever closed. I could hear my father talking to his mother. Ma, it's time to go. What are you waiting for? As they continued pleading with my dead grandmother, I heard the rumbling of an engine racing up the driveway of the church. It was my uncle, late as usual, even to his own mother's funeral. Real Hawaiian time, as we would say. He puts on his white gloves and kneels in front of the pastor, apologizing for his tardiness. Why he was late, I don't know. But as he took his place at the coffin, across from my father, they lifted the coffin once again. My grandmother's coffin floated off the ground, light as a feather, they said. They walked another 15 steps or so to the hearse. They said it was like my grandmother floated to the car. Even in her death, she was still as strong as ever, refusing to leave this world without her two boys by her side to lead her to the next. Story number four. Grandmother and grandfather hear my father's plea for help. Yes, there is a story number four. How, you may ask? As I said before, her guardianship does not end in her death. How comforting, yeah? This took place two years after my grandparents had passed. This one involves my father and mother, and every time he tells the story, the facts never change. My parents had gone to Hilo for the weekend, on the other side of the island. We have family in Keokaha that they would visit from time to time. Now, geez, that's another chapter right there. But anyway... My father and mother decide to spend the night at Hilo Seaside Hotel, right down the road. My father himself, being half Hawaiian and half Filipino, always had a sixth sense, and sometimes it was a nightmare, as it started that way that night. It was around 2.30 in the morning, and they were sleeping in room number 102, queen-size bed. 
The room was small and the door to the room was real close to the bed. If you open the door and walk to the right, it leads you down a flight of stairs, across a small garden area, through a swinging gate, and into the parking lot. My father was being visited once again, by a choking ghost. This has happened to him on many occasions in his life, but as he tells me to this day, it was one of his last encounters. As the clock reads 2.36 a.m., he is woken up by a feeling of fear in the pit of his stomach. He could see a shadow forming at the foot of the door. The shadow leaks under the crack of the door and up the door onto the ceiling. He began rubbing his eyes to adjust to the darkness, the tint of yellow light coming through the sliding glass door on the other side of the bed. My mother was sound asleep. He thought for a second of waking her. As he looked closer and closer at the shadow, it began to take the shape of a womanly form. Only now the shape was that of a gecko crawling on the wall, the arms and legs bent out and away from the center of the body. He was disgusted as this thing begins crawling on the ceiling, making its way above the bed. As soon as it is hovering over my father, it drops from the ceiling and lands on his chest. This womanly creature had a face, he said, a horrible face with a slithering tongue. It wraps its legs around my father's stomach, and the hands grasp his arms, holding him down on the bed. He was frozen in fear as he attempted to wake my mother from her sleep. My mother is of Caucasian descent, so she was usually not as affected by these things as my father was. The womanly creature stares directly into his eyes. He says it was just grinning at him as he began to feel his throat tighten and his esophagus lock up. He was gasping for breath as he tried his best to get this thing off. The creature began shrieking as he was slipping in and out of consciousness. He said he felt as if he was taking his last breath when all of a sudden the door swings open. There was another shadow standing inside the frame of the door. As it walked into the room, the yellow light hit the face, the face of my grandmother. He hears his mother shout, Aole mamake, you cannot have my son. She begins cursing at the thing. Even though the thing was still on my father's chest, he was bewildered at the fact that his dead mother was standing in front of him as if her flesh were still real. There was a bright light coming from behind her. As my grandmother continued to curse and curse at the thing in Hawaiian, it finally let off and scampered off, dissipating into the sliding glass door. My father could not take his eyes off his mother, but she doesn't say a word to him, just stares at him for a few seconds, smiling. She turns around and walks out of the room and out the door of their hotel room. This is when my mother wakes up. Even if you were to put my parents into separate rooms, they would still recall the same story. My mother joins my father at the door, asking him what's going on. My dad was staring down the corridor where the stairs were. That's when my mother's eyes focused on my grandmother, who was still walking. She walked down the steps and past the garden. She looked as alive as ever. No more limping, no more pain as she walked. She walks out the swinging gate into the parking lot. That's when they realized that she was walking to a parked car at the corner, facing out toward the front street of the hotel. The brake lights were glowing red, but he could make out the blue bumper of his father's 62 Mazda. In the reflection of the rear view mirror, he could see his father's face. He was right there, sitting in the driver's seat of the car. They watched as my grandmother approached the car, saying to him, Okay, Papa, we go now. Our boy is okay. She gets into the passenger seat. They remember watching the glowing of the brake lights as the car disappeared into the darkness. So, there you have it. I hope this gave you an ounce of insight into the wonderful woman that my grandmother is. And for you, Kanaka Maoli, an insight into the wonderful people that all of our Tutuhine and Tutukane are. And if you still have the fortune of having them here in this world right now, don't take another second for granted. Because with them, they take our past, our tradition, and our inherent right to be proud of who we are. 
please take this chance to ask them as much as you can, jot it down, and share it with the rest of the world before it's gone. I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two coworkers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my coworkers was outside smoking when he called to me and another coworker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building, two stories, so maybe 30 feet. I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights, with the largest at the bottom center of the V, with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location, changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, then back to a V, before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two, I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale, multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m. Even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. This happened in the summer of 2019 when I went to visit my cousins in India. They had recently built a new kitchen and two modernized bedrooms in the basement. Initially, I thought it was a sweet gesture that my cousin allowed me to stay in his room and make it my own for the month that I stayed there. Little did I know that I would soon be encountering some unexplainable things. This will be a pretty long story, as I want to explain it thoroughly enough, so you can imagine the situation clearly. The first incident. The home alone incident. I was told by my cousin that he needed to go out with some friends and would return in the next 15 minutes or so. No one else was at home except for the maid. I tend to get vibes of areas pretty quickly, 
And it's safe to say that the basement made me feel pretty uneasy. I was hesitant. However, I had nothing to do upstairs and the TV was downstairs in my room. So I went down there with my cousin's dog. The room felt incredibly cold, which is strange for a room in India in the summer. I hadn't turned on the air conditioning and nobody else had been downstairs, not even the maid. I went to get the remote from the cabinet under the TV. It was a pretty loose cabinet. Sometimes it would swing open by itself. So it felt strange that I was unable to open it despite tugging on it pretty hard. The dog began to shuffle backward whilst staring at something in front of me, next to the cabinet. There was nothing there, not even an insect. The entire month that I was there, this was the sole time that I ever heard a sound from that dog. He's typically pretty quiet, but the sound he made wasn't a bark. It's hard to describe, but it's almost like he was in pain, almost screaming. It wasn't a pleasant sound at all. The dog then ran back upstairs. He's quite a lazy dog, so it was kind of odd to see him run at such a speed. Suddenly, the room went back to its normal warm temperature and the cabinet swung open. I nearly fell on the floor from the force that I had applied to the cabinet to try to open it. I put on a movie and I tried to calm down. My cousin came in around a few minutes later and I told him what happened. He was also very confused by the noise which the dog made and he opened the cabinet in front of me with just two fingers trying to show me how easy it was to open. The second incident, the anklets. My cousin's sister and I were both having a late night talk one night at around two or 3 a.m. Everyone else was asleep upstairs in their rooms. Suddenly, we both heard anklets moving upstairs and then we heard it getting louder. It was going down the stairs and coming toward us. Initially, I got excited, thinking it was my other cousin's sister who decided to join us. However, I was confused as to why she would suddenly decide to join in, despite previously saying she didn't want to, and hence going to sleep a few hours prior. My cousin's sister is next to me. We'll call her M. M is very brave and jokey, so I was incredibly concerned when I saw how shocked she looked. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, no one in the house wears anklets, and they don't own any either. I thought it was an intruder. At this point, the anklet noise had just reached the bottom of the stairs and was turning around the bend to enter the kitchen, which was located directly outside the room. I stood behind the wall with M, and we were ready to trap whoever this person was. The anklets stepped up the step and the sound stopped directly outside the door where we stood. There was no one there. We were incredibly confused, so we checked all over the basement and turned on all of the lights. We then called my other cousin's sister, but she was still sleeping, so she didn't pick up. We went straight back into bed and I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep that night. Incident three the blanket. This happened two nights after the anklet incident. I had finished watching yet another movie and was ready to sleep at around 3 a.m. This time, my cousin's brother said he would sleep on a mattress, which was laid across the floor by the end of the bed in order to make me feel better if I was scared since M was out that night and I was too traumatized by the anklet incident. My cousin's brother was already asleep and I was about to sleep as well. I'm sure many of you can relate to me when I say that I sleep by curling up. So I did just that and laid on my side. As my eyes were getting heavier, I began to notice that my blanket was being pulled down. Of course, this couldn't have been me as I was curled up and my hands were gripping onto the blanket at the top near my face. I thought it was the dog, but then I remembered he went to sleep hours ago, upstairs. 
Everyone's doors are shut upstairs when they sleep, so there was no way that he could have come downstairs, and I would have noticed if he did. Then I thought maybe it was my cousin pulling on it in his sleep. I was too tired, so I tried to sleep again. The tugging happened again, but this time more aggressively. The blanket was actually snatched out of my hand from the force. I also felt pressure at the end of the bed, as if someone was sitting there. I turned my torch on, but nothing was there. You could see that the blanket had been pulled as it was very uneven on that side. I tried to wake my cousin up, but he wasn't anywhere near that end of the bed, and he was in deep sleep. I called my other cousin on the phone. He lives about a half an hour away from that house, and I put him on speaker so that we could both shout my cousin's name for him to wake up, but he didn't. Needless to say, I was stuck there and couldn't sleep, so I sat up with the light on for the rest of the night. I pretty much looked like a zombie at this point from lack of sleep. The last incident, but not the least scary, was the face. So this happened around a week after the blanket incident. M was sleeping beside me again as I was far too scared to sleep alone at this point. I had just said goodnight to her and we were about to fall asleep. Again, this was around two or three in the morning. I actually started sleeping, but then I felt incredibly uneasy. That feeling like you're being watched. I suddenly woke up and directly stared into the face of something pale. Something or someone, who knows. I couldn't see eyes, but the shape looked like it should have been a face. Despite not seeing eyes, I still felt like I was being watched. I let out a small squeal because I was so scared. My voice just abandoned me. M woke up to see if I was okay as soon as that face disappeared. As soon as I began telling her what I saw, we heard the gate crash outside the room. To put this into perspective, if you walk out of the room and kitchen and continue walking straight within the basement, there are stairs which lead to a heavy metal gate so that you can get onto the main road. There was no one walking around on the streets that night. There usually never is, especially at that time of night. Even if a kid tried knocking on the gate outside, the sound would be too deep for what we heard. The gate crashing sound, which I'm talking about, is the sound it makes if someone were to open it and then slam it shut. Sometimes M's dad leaves for work very early in the morning and returns later in the evening. However, later that day when M and I went upstairs for breakfast, he had just woken up and it wasn't him. Even if it had been, why would he use the basement gate instead of the main door to leave the house, which was upstairs? In conclusion, it was a very weird experience. I don't know what I experienced, honestly, but something was up with that basement. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. 
As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack 
to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped. And then, the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in 
and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. <laughs>